You have reached the Geek Elite. Good luck. So, I have a question. Have you ever wanted to get into comics, but you just didn't know where to start? Well, welcome to Comics Quest. I'm JD Martin, and every week I sit down with a guest to talk a comic that I think anybody can pick up and start their comics reading journey. We take a look at psychedelic sci-fi, fantastical action, heart-wrenching love stories, and of course, superheroes. So check us out at certainpov.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Welcome, everybody, to We Have Issues, Geek Elite Media show that's about everything literary, books, comic books, web comics, manga, and everything else you might be reading. We are here to talk about it. As always, I am your host, Keith, and I'm joined by my stalwart sidekick, who is at my side, host way. I love it when comics just give me the answers that I've been waiting for. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's some endings this week, guys, that we're going to be getting to. There's a couple big endings, so... No, my big one was involving masks, but we'll get to that one. Oh, yeah. I yeah. can love those answers. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we're going to go ahead and get into our comics, of course. Uh, however, we always start with a little bit of comic book news. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Josue, did anything jump out at you this week? Uh, nothing that I've seen, actually, but you might remind me. Um, well, I'm just thinking. Uh, the one thing I saw was I know Kelly Thompson did a Substack deal, but she's already confirmed that it's not going to affect her Marvel books. They're still okay. going to go on as as planned. So um, that's the one big thing I think, as far as comic book news that jumped out of me. But I'm just double checking really quickly here. Um, Oops. Yeah, um, I don't think we had a lot of big announcements or anything either. Is the thing? I so. think everybody's waiting on to see what DC is going to pull out for. Her fandom coming up soon mm. oh house of slaughter number one oh, was huh. delayed due to overwhelming printers capacity oh no shit it was pre-ordered so hard that it basically overloaded the printers wow well, that's good that's cool yeah it's great i'm very excited about that because that's gonna be so good mm-hmm. um and then wonder woman got inducted into the comic-con character hall of fame which to me i was like Barely. Why isn't she already in it? <laughs> like, Seriously. <laughs> is there more than four characters in it? Then why isn't she one of them? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. So, um, Other than that, I mostly see previews and reviews for comics. So not much to go on. Uh, mm-hmm. That's fine. We will go ahead and go straight into our comics because yes. we'll save your time. Not waste your time. So as always, we're going to start with a big old boom. Boom Studios. Yes. we got two books. Uh, I'll start off with a one shot firefly river run you guys know i'm a firefly fan mm. uh, i got this awesome holographic cover nice and you can see she has her hands over her head but she can actually see through them so it's kind of yeah cool. uh so i thought i was done with firefly with after brand new verse i was like yeah that was a good place to end and then david boer had to go to firefly so. <laughs> written by david boer illustrated by andres genolette uh color by mattia iacono and letter by jim campbell um, so this is a one shot and it all it literally is. If you're familiar with your Firefly lore, um, at the very beginning of the series, Simon breaks his sister river out of, you know, confinement where she's being studied by the bad guys. This is the story of that. This is how he broke in. This is all the deals he had to make the massive damage he did to his personal life by doing so. And it was really good. Like David's really good about writing, uh, intimate stories. And that's kind of what this is. It's a very intimate story about, Two people, you know, a brother and sister who love each other and how, you know, he, he's going to do whatever it takes to save her. And it's just really well done. I really, really liked it. It's an excellent addition. I hope they do more of these where they fill in blanks of the past of Firefly and not so much digging into the future of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's fine. The future stuff's good, but there's lots of little holes I'd like for them to fill in. And they did that for a little while. Like I remember a Shepherd's Tale they did for Shepherd Book was a really great series. Uh, and I think Wash got a prequel series too. So, um, but yeah, I really, really dug this, and I think he nails River as a character. I think he does a really good job with her. And um, Simon, this is the most interesting Simon's been since 
since the movie actually. <laughs> so yeah, really, really good. I really enjoyed that. So next up is our other boom book. And uh, it's something is killing the children. Number 20 um, yeah. written by James Tynion, Tynion the fourth uh, drawn by Werther Della Dera and colored by Mikel Moretto and lettered by Anne Roll. I just did that from memory. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I was trying to find it and I was like, well, I know this one. I know this one. And then I was like, oh, I should said the whole thing. Um, so we're still in the past with Erica and how she became a member of the House of Slaughter. And when we left off, she was struggling with her inner monster. And with it, either she's going to die or become a full-on member. And we know because we, we read the last issue, but the rest of the crew didn't know what's going on. We get a really cool reveal page where it reveals that she made it. That was so cool. Like, awesome. Yeah. With the dogs and everything. That, that could easily be a poster. <laughs> um, but the real key to this book, and I think this is one of the best timed issues of a comic book ever made, is they literally break down the House of Slaughter for us. Yeah. They give us all the lore just in time for House and Slaughter number one. <laughs> it's <laughs> so. really the one thing I've been so curious about. It's like these masks have meaning. Like, like even like the, the position, not the position mm-hmm. of the teeth, like that means anything. But I love that they all like have their own style and like they're all keeping to themselves in their own way. It's just like they're all just like not not just their own groups. And yeah, we get to find out like all what the masks mean. It's awesome. Uh, my personal favorite is the Azure mask. Oh, yeah. I knew you would. <laughs> it's, it's so pretty. I, I do like a blue, though. Um, but yeah, basically, we find out that they the, the different color masks have different specialties, including the emerald masks. They hunt dragons. Oh, just so specific. Was like, <laughs> like everybody else, I mean, like even like like I would fucking love to just like just dive deep into a, a silver mask and just like I'll just pr- just be a pro at one fucking thing and like, I want uh, hunting one thing or just all, all these like mystical stuff. But oh, the silver masks were cool, but then emerald masks just. Just dragons. It's like just what, <laughs> and then it's like, of course, each of the pages like as it'll it'll just say what you're thinking, like or it's like, can I, I want to see a dragon? You and me both. Or it's like, was it? Can I meet one? It was like because like the dude hasn't even met one himself. Yeah. So because he says basically dragons don't exist in America. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, it's just a really great origin story. And it's a lot of fun. I love little Erica. She's adorable. Yeah. Like, just her big ass eyes. <laughs> like I just love her to death. So um this is so good and it makes me it makes me want House of Slaughter even more, mm-hmm. especially when we get a preview for House of Slaughter at the end. Yeah. With Aaron, who I maybe maybe he'll be okay, Jose. <laughs> 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 maybe somehow. Okay. I like Aaron. I like Aaron. <laughs> I like Aaron too. <laughs> but yeah. Um loved it really great that it got me hyped really hyped for the for the spinoff and as soon as i turned that page with the different masks i was like look at boom just printing money <laughs> you know those they're gonna sell i know like, it's right there yeah i know right i have one too and now i'm like well i need it now i need it as your one and like in a silver one i definitely want a silver one because that's pretty dope yeah and i was like jesus christ like like I know, uh, like I've read enough of J- James's inf- stuff that he's not the guy who's like I'm gonna do something because it's marketable, right? But we know that if you do something like say I don't know Houses of Hogwarts, <laughs> and you sell merchandise where you're like you're this and you're this and you're this, then you're gonna sell a billion of them. <laughs> and so these masks, like fuck, <laughs> like, I want to buy them all. <laughs> I know. I definitely want to have like an ensemble for for each mask. Yeah. So excellent book wonderful i can't wait for more so all right let's switch over to aftershock hosway talk to me about out of body okay i will be kind of quick about it because it is the penultimate issue um basically the the, the one this is one about uh, out of body out of body experiences slash like astral projections and how people are able to do that um in this case our protagonist who realizes that he actually has been an asshole uh to everybody close to his life and him and why he's figuring this out is because he's locked out of his body and basically his physical body is in a coma and he has a week to live or else the hospital is pulling the plug. So I was like, obviously somebody put him here. So he literally, he's literally kind of like checking out like the list of any, anybody who was close to him to who would, uh, on who would hurt him. Cause he can just like tap into, uh, people. Um, so it's kind of going body to body. He realizes like one of his patients, um, kind of calls out to him, not really realizing that the bad guys are kind of manipulating that that ghost because that person's already dead. Um, but we're not manipulating that ghost to lure um, our our 
quote unquote good doctor. Um, so yeah, it's all going to come come to a head because now the bad guys know that they're kind of like figuring out. Like now the bad guys know that the good guys know, you know. So yeah, we'll come to the ending probably next month with Out of Body. Nice, uh, creative team. Oh yeah, thank you. This one is uh, P- uh, Peter Milligan as the writer, uh, Inaki Miranda as the artist, uh, Eva de la Cruz as colorist, Sal Cipriano as the letterer. Nice. All right, our other Aftershock book is 10 Years to Death, one of the supersized one-shots that Aftershock's been doing. Yes. Uh, creative team, Aaron Douglas writing, uh, drawn by Cliff Richards, colored by Guy Major, and letter by Dave Sharp. So uh, I'm going to tell the quick story that Josue knows is coming. Uh, I was... Uh, looking at my copy last night and I was like, this looks signed. And I'm like, that's Aaron Douglas' signature, but he's not from around here. That's weird. I'm like, is it printed on there? Like, or is this an actual signature? So I asked Josue, hey, is there a signature on your copy? And I found out he has a different cover. (laughs) (laughs) I have a variant cover where they signed 1,000 copies. And I happened to buy one of those copies, I guess, without realizing (laughs) it. So that's pretty pretty fucking sweet. So here's the whole cover, if you want to see it. It is really cool. Yeah, when you ask me, I'm like, you mean like the artist signature? That's like on almost every yeah. other thing? It's like, nope, not <laughs> that. <laughs> so um, my cover is by Michael Gatos for the record. So Cool. Um, so it's another one of these a- oversized Aftershock books. And this one is just this really cool, dread-inducing, like, it's not a horror. It's a thriller, is what I would say. Right. But with dread. Like, so thriller's like, huh, huh, this is more like a slow, creepy build, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, and it was done so good. Like, I really liked this one. Of, I, of the three that we've gotten, this is probably my favorite. Oh, really? Nice. Of the three big aftershocks, yeah. I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but I have a huge appreciation towards this book. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not knocking it for, for any reason at all. Um, like, it was like Eden. And uh, God of Tremors had that like holy shit factor, like like tr- page turner. It's like oh fuck it, it's all led up to this. I was waiting for it for an, on this one, but because I we got the different a different type of delivery, it's not like oh it's, it's not as good or it kind of sucks. Like no, no no no, I just I appreciate it because this one just felt like that that fu- that that ghost campfire story that someone would tell, like like that slow burn, like you said like you said instead of just like a holy shit of uh, like. Like wow, back like the other two, so it's like it was good in its own way, but and I think that that's really where it excelled. I I love how that like you said, like that slow burn, like that classic mm-hmm. ghost tale. Loved it, loved it so much. I love that you said it that way because honestly, that's what I was going to bring up. Is to me, this series of one shots have felt like people sitting around a campfire telling ghost stories. Ooh, yeah. Like, it's like this, oh, she always came and got a different tattoo, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. Like, it really feels like that, and I think that's really cool. It's like. Because they're all kind of horror themed, you know, mm-hmm. and that's just really fun. Like I dig it. Like, yeah. Again, I, not a horror person, but I'm really digging this. So nice, and it's beautiful. It's a really, really great book. And yeah, the oh, the oversized. It's great. It's not great for boxing it, but it's great. For <laughs> that's right. It. So, yeah, I'm gonna have to get an oversized box. Thanks. So, um, uh, next up, let's move on to uh, Josue telling yes. me about. Some behemoth books, starting with Turbo Kid. Yes, when I saw when I saw these words like under Behemoth, it was like those sons of bitches did it again. The sons of bitches at, over at All Hell Behemoth lured me back in with another number one, with another IP, and that is Turbo Kid. Have you have, did you ever see Turbo Kid? I have no idea what that is. I doubt it because it's a it's a <laughs> <laughs> no 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 it's um. <laughs> It's a Mad Max, ex- Mad Max, expi- Mad Max inspired um, B rated movie, but for all of the charming qualities that make a B type of movie, uh, in the distant future of, in the distant apocalyptic future of 1997, <laughs> and because it's such a, like low budget movie, instead it, of having like, 2015, yes, yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> but because the budget is incredibly low, instead of having an all-out car chase scene, Mad Max style, there are still like in these like deserty, duny areas, but they all have bicycles instead. <laughs> it's still very much a post-apoc story and a very good one. It's like it's like if Super had a lesser budget. It, it, it goes off a lot because then it gets like incredibly gory on parts of how people just die over like all these like 
machines that are just are left around and there are some robots so anyway terrible kid is back with a comic on a little two-parter called apple's lost adventure and this is basically a prequel to uh how apple meets our turbo kid at first i thought it wasn't because it's like you get the lead up on like how the apocalypse came to be mm-hmm. and then you you're you're with uh we start with uh, apple and she was the well, she's with the boy with uh football helmet and kind of like just skinny and scrawny is like is our turbo kid and the conversation is not going well it's like are we just picking up where we left off and they're are they killing turbo kid no no no, no. i had to like look into it and it's, it's just like a prequel to how she meets up with I was him gonna say it's a prequel right yeah yeah because yeah. she has a, she stays with the body for like the whole time where it's like she's not like leaving and it's like and the body just starts decomposing and they start basically a uh, uh, hunter start uh, approaching them and like they don't realize they don't realize that apple is a is an android herself and then uh, but she has her own defense mechanism so she starts kicking ass it's really cool i really appreciate uh, this movie you should def- try to rec- uh, watch it whenever you can maybe right now for the spooky holidays because <laughs> it is like again like the charmingness of a where you can appreciate like a b shitty movie but in a post apoc and like with what little they can do with a small budget it, it's, it's it's a very cool uh movie so and now we have a little two-part comic and the way it's drawn like the way it is it's like that old school like just comics like the way they what kind of almost like not that many colors but the way the palette is the way that the way it's drawn it's just like it has like this like old school effect like because like it's also set in 1997 i think it's just like going for that kind of homage for it so we get more tober kids uh i was just looking at it and apparently there's a video game coming yeah i saw in a, it in a metrovania style metroidvania style i'm so excited i I'm, i cannot wait for that to come out <laughs> <laughs> yeah awesome all right, well, let's then let's switch over to Cinnamon 3. Oh, boy. Cinnamon 3. I hope it's not the finale. Please, I just see a 3 out of 3, and it's like, I hope we just get more adventures of Cinnamon. <sighs> so, Cinnamon. Um, oh, sorry, and the Turbo Kid, the, the comic was actually written um, and illustrated. It was written by the director, writer for the movie, and illustrated by the person who did the storyboards for the, for the movie. Oh, cool, okay. And so Cinnamon, this one done by Victoria Douglas. Um, so last last episode, last issue, our poor girl Cinnamon got her ass beat by the laser, the laser pointer. That's I right. This. <laughs> yeah, and so much so that it caused a tragedy at the at the local orphanage, the couch. And Cinnamon has not been feeling herself lately. Like we, there's like a little brunch scene with like the owner with her friend, and it's like, oh, it's so cute. Like I played with the laser pointer at her. She, she got, she got so tuckered out afterwards. Like you, you should have seen her. It was, it was cute. And the friend's like, wait, but you meant to like, you pointed us. You threw like a, a toy at her, right? And it's like, what? What do you mean? Like you get them going, but because they can't catch it, you're supposed to like point it or at least like have their let them let let them take out their aggression out on Direct something. Them. Yeah, yeah. And she was like, oh fuck. Well, my bad. <laughs> yeah. So, and then you realize, like, oh my god, Cinnamon is just like so distraught right now. So, on the way home, she actually picks up like a like a, a stuffed animal, a toy. But in Cinnamon's world, it's like this dope giant mech. But right now, Cinnamon isn't viewing this, so it's just funny that it's just a like, cutting to this as like the owners are uh, buying it. Um, so yeah, we cut to back at home, and like I said, distraught Cinnamon. Ah, focus. Distraught Cinnamon is at the two bowls, just getting hammered on her failure and <laughs> the spider bartender is just like just i mean like encouraging but also just trying to be there for cinnamon and then sure enough who shows up but the owner like in, again in the in the, the cinnamon's uh, uh world and it's like yo take this fucking briefcase <laughs> and what is it these dope ass rocket boots <laughs> and cinnamon is like what cool i'm back in the action it sucks they have to work together because it basically the, the laser pointer is out of control now so now with Cinnamon, with now with new Rocket Boots, um, approaches the laser pointer again. And, uh, but in this case, they trap the laser in the body. <laughs> again, it's how, it's, uh, it's how Cinnamon is viewing this. So now what the laser pointer thinks as an upgrade in a mech suit has become physical. And oh, look at this uppercut. Look at that dope uppercut. <laughs> <laughs> It just becomes a crazy thing, and, and obviously, like we, she can take out her aggression now. Uh, she's fighting, and it just becomes a dope fight. In the end, enemies become friends. All is right with the world. We get ourselves a cool ass battle. Super fucking anime. I fuck. I, I love cinnamon so much, and I just really hope 
this isn't the end. <laughs> it's just amazing. It, it's it's so adorable, so wholesome, and it's just about a cat and their wacky adventures in their in their own room. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah, I know you've really been enjoying it. So <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Let's switch up uh, publishers, and we're gonna go to Vault. Yes. So Vault. Uh, we got one book this week, and it's a number one though. And that is Human Remains. Now, Soy, what cover did you get? Uh, just cover A. I got this one. Ooh, that's a good one, yeah. You can see, like, a bloody shoe in the mm-hmm. flowers, so, yeah. So, Creative Team is written by Peter Milligan. That's his second appearance on this episode, yeah. for the record. Uh, drawn by Sally Cantorino. Color by Dear Buck Kelly. And letter by Ann World. And what did you think of this book? Uh, it's, it's a vault book. <laughs> it's certainly a vault book. And, and I love vault. So that's a compliment. Um, with a lot of all books, they introduce, here's a world, here's the rules, go. <laughs> like, you know, like, and that's kind of what they do. And in this one, it kind of reminds me of a couple of the ones we've gotten recently, like, uh, like a dead box, you know, and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. Like, where it's like, okay, we're going to show you this. It's set, obviously, in modern times. Here's the twist. Here's what we do with the twist, which is great. That's what Vault is really good at. Mm-hmm. And I don't think this is really an exception to that. Um, I will tell everybody out there, it's incredibly gory. Yeah. So if gore bothers you, it's gorier than the autumnal was. <laughs> like, right. So if gore bothers you, then you know maybe not your thing. But as far as the story goes, I think it's got a really interesting hook. I think it, they did a really good job of setting up a bunch of characters, some of which don't matter in the end. <laughs> um, and I think it, it's one of the I, I, the other thing with Vault, like I said, they set up a situation and they tell you, accept this. This is the rule, right? Mm-hmm. So in this case, there's creatures that whenever people show it outward emotion out in public, they just show up and rip them to shreds, basically. Yeah. Uh, so I think Vault does a really good job of bringing things up that makes us think about things. Mm -hmm. It's not just like, oh, and then they died. You know, they're actually like, what would it mean not to be able to, you know, show emotion? Like if you had to suppress it, what would that do to you? You know, and it it kind of set up a situation where, you know, we had to kind of think about that, you know? And I thought that was really interesting. Um, I know you're talking about the rules. Like it's like the, the one set rule besides like the the obvious, like don't show emotions is that um, these, this, this, Locus basically doesn't register beings under or from five years and under. Yes. So it's like, how would you hold a kid back to just not be excited over anything? Yeah. You know, that's a really good rule too, because yeah, because yeah, it would it would be really grim if a baby crying would be killed immediately. You know, what right? I mean? Like so, yeah, that's that's really good. I, I like that a lot. It reminds me of Quiet Place. You know, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So that little bit of it, you know, like, mm-hmm. how do you keep a child under control? So. Oh, for sure. Um. Yeah, I really dug it, though. Um, I, I like the art quite a bit. Uh, I think the characters were distinct. Um, I like only, only one? I, cu- I couldn't tell if his dad was the general in the beginning. I, I, didn't, know, I didn't know if there was, like, a time. I think uh, like, it was. Okay, because I couldn't tell if there was, like, a before or after, if it was, like, completely linear. Cause then, like, his... They looked a lot alike, or I think the, the way it was framed, it looked like a reveal. <laughs> right. I want to say that, too, yeah. but, like, his hair got incredibly longer in that moment where it was just like kind of trimmed up like in the when his skin is all generaled out yeah. but if he was I, I guess so it was like the one thing it was and the hair was like a little bit lighter brown over darker brown again I mean, it might be someone else uh, it could be. honestly that would have just added a special angle to you know it probably wasn't because he was actually talking about investments not the military <laughs> no, you're right you're right he wouldn't just yeah. like do scam that guy too yeah and yeah. i guess like, that was like the one weird thing is like if we know that there's like this happening around why would we have a why would we have a wedding where it would be nothing but emotion yeah well it's where it's it's where it first happened it's where it first happened yeah, is where it starting started, so yeah. okay they make that point they say no one forgets where they were that day yeah, yeah okay cool. so it was going before okay but yeah i dug it vaults always knocks it out of the park mm-hmm. and we'll see where it goes so all right now we're gonna start digging into some deep deep territory and first of all, we are going to look at image. Uh, we have a stack, and I'm going to start Josue off with the good Asian number five. The good Asian number five. Holy shit! <laughs> this one written by Pornstock Pish- uh, Pishishote, 
Alexander, uh, Alexandria Tifengi as the artist, Lee Lutheridge as a colorist, and Jeff Powell as the letter and designer. We pretty much just get backstory on this one, and then this one being the the volume closer for mm-hmm. getting. We're getting to like the this is like the first half of the story. It's just a ten issue mini, so we get a backstory because where we really get last left off was the alleged um, hatchet man named Huey Long wasn't exactly Huey Long, but just an imposing white man who was trying to tarnish the Chinese race even more. So. Edison, uh, Edison Hark discovers that it's just some white guy and he has like, is it really going to be his voice against some person in the wind that we just have to pin it on some, a random citizen, a random white citizen. So I was like, before we get to that, that person also killed his surrogate brother, Frankie. And what we're going to do with this body. But before we do any of that, <laughs> let's go with a little bit of backstory on kind of like the bond between like the, the two brothers and the bond that also shaped that into the sister and that one time where edison was with this girl and imagining the surrogate sister it was because they were actually getting it off the whole time they were kind of growing up but as they put it it wasn't weird because she was like pretty much like studying abroad at a all-girls school for like 10 years so they weren't ever super close and how they put it he's obviously chinese so it's like but it's still kind of weird very very weird so they have this secret thing for like years um and what his position what edison's position should be kind of going into the family this is still kind of before he's if if he's really going to become a cop he was uh kind of like the surrogate dad that kind of like the whole why this whole murder uh mystery is starting um he was almost gonna like he was there was almost a talk that it was they were never going to trust Frankie. It was never going to be, they were never going to leave the company to the daughter back in those days. So it might actually just fall on Edison to, to run the company. And I'm, I was, could have been one of those things where he probably felt the pressure. He probably, he probably didn't want this, this role. So he started to kind of almost like alienate himself, not from the whole family. Cause obviously like, why would you leave such a good thing? Especially when you're a Chinese in the, in the 1920s. Um, it's more like alienating himself from the sister. So at least like they can just be like a weird set of boundaries. And sure enough, he kind of, he sets it up to where he gets caught having sex with another, with another, another person. And we find out how he got the scar across his eye. It was, uh, the sister literally fucking just like backhands him with a fucking huge ring. I guess, I guess it gashes deep because that's, it's uh, that car is just like his defining trait basically. So all of this, all of this, and it's like he never got to tell Frankie the truth. Or at least Frankie never got to find out the truth at, at this point. And now we're we're at the end of the issue. We're back at the present. And what's he gonna do? Is he gonna leave this dead white kid in the streets of Ch- of Chinatown, where pretty much all hell will, will come more, it will just become more loose here uh, from the authorities, especially when it's a high profile uh, kid. Or is, Frank, or is Edison going to go hide the body and do another naughty thing? Of course he's going to do the, the naughty thing. Page turns. There's another cop that just finds him with the body over his shoulders, uh, about to put him in the trunk. Uh-oh. <laughs> and that's where it ends. It's like, oh, fuck. That's literally the last word of the, uh, uh, of the book. <laughs> so, yeah. Edison Hark, man. You are just a troubled, troubled case, man. I don't think you should be a detective. <laughs> but it makes for a damn good drama series. A good noir. Awesome. All right, my solo image is Undiscovered Country 16. Ooh, okay. Uh, so, uh, of course, creative team written by Scott Snyder and Charles Soule, drawn by Giuseppe Comancoli and Leonardo Marcello Grassi, uh, coloring by Matt Wilson, lettering by Crank. So this one, uh, once again, this is the group traveling through the new future version of America, all these different worlds that represent different parts of America, and they're currently traveling through basically the artistic part of America, the creative part. And yeah. they have to create an American masterpiece. Well, in this one, they travel to the land of music, American music. And there's a really cool part where they see a, a like a signpost and it points all these different directions. And they realize it's the genres of music that were, that uh, were created in America, each one. So they're kind of like, Oh, like, you know, um, it's like, like just, funky town and like, just sing tribute from Tenacious D. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then we get a recurring appearance of 
the devil at the crossroads who is still taking on the Robert Johnson appearance. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah, and he seems to be the one leading all these uh, creative people, basically. Uh, they found an everything engine where basically it's a thing that if you you can just make it, it can make anything you want, basically. Hmm. And um, one of our characters, he he ends up figuring out that to make it work, you have it needs your blood, basically. You have to put your hand and put it on a spike and it, it cuts your hand and it creates a thing from your head, basically. So, and that's kind of where it leads off. The anything engine goes off. You see Whoa. all these ships going towards the island, and the nice. thing goes into the sky. So, yeah, it was, it was really cool. I'm really. I, this is probably my favorite world so far. Nice. I'm really yeah, digging it. That's how interesting. Yeah, it's got some um, some quotes at the end here. Like the info pages on this are almost as good as Hickman's X Men pages. Nice. Uh, so quotes from different artists, including KRS One, who I love, by the way. Um, in the future, hip hop is going to be called American culture or American folklore. Uh, <laughs> fuck yeah, like it is. Cool. Actually. Yeah. And then they, they made this creepy creature that they called One Man Band. It's made of instruments. Ooh, okay. And in the back, they actually break down how they designed it, and they pointed out like each thing is like, well, that's Van Halen's guitar. That's Neil Peart's gong. Like. Prince is the the like the Prince symbol guitar, the one that's yeah. like his symbol. You can see it right there. At top. Oh no shit! Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so yeah. cool. <laughs> they literally took all these famous like mu- musical instruments to make it. So, including what I thought was very funny is down here hanging from its neck is Flavor Flav's clock. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, but no, really cool. Really digging into Discover Country, and it's just it's only gotten better for me as the series goes on. So I'm really like I'm loving it. Um, no way. Tell me about Department of True 13. Oh boy, do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this was written by James Tynan IV. Artist is Martin Simmons. Lettering by Dita Peter Carr. <sighs> what are we going to do, Keith? <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> We're being issue 13. We are on chapter 10 because it does like those weird little parts. Right. This one being. Hawks Inferno. You should just see, if you could just see like read like the text on how it's done. If you just I can just see like in, like in, like those like bloody splash like old school mo- like movie horror like ways. Yeah. But anyway, so Hawk took Cole on a little side trip from when we last left off. After the whole Denver trip with like the airport thing and the whole uh, Bigfoot scenario, he was supposed to come back to the department. Cole was because uh, Hawk was supposed to bring him back, or at least like meet him up with uh, his partner was it Ruby. Um, so he, so we can go back to the to the department. No, Hawk had a side trip uh, planned out to go back to the beginning, back to Hawk's uh, to Cole's old home. God, I don't want to say Kansas, but it is like in the Midwest, basically where where it all started, where where we found out a few last issue or a few uh, two issues ago, where that Hawk was the one that actually went to his house after Cole had had his um conspiracy episode if you will something that something bad happened to her, that, that happened here to him at school so why does hawk bring him to his home that cole has chose to subconsciously however basically n- everything in his body has basically just not not even not let him he's just never wanted to come back to this place obviously those are bad memories but not even out of curiosity, I, almost like it, it doesn't play. It does the thing where it's like everybody tends to go back home, you know. Everybody has to like, re- retrace their steps once they can. But Cole did it because I mean it was a fucked up thing that happened here too. So again, like why would he? Man, there's a whole sequence that happens here where once we're inside of the house, Hawk starts letting on that it's like Barker knows the being like basically the the counter organization from the department, the Black Hats, and he starts letting him on. It's like. Barker's been knowing, and you've known that he wants you. So here's the deal, and this is where Cole finds out. Is like, have you been double crossing the department? And yeah, Hawk has been playing both sides, mm. um, but not into to take down the department because Hawk is the one that's been out there not not the longest, but just as long as as we know as Lee Harvey Oswald or uh, fucking what's his face, like the the guy running the Black Hats. Um, Hawk starts having a conspiracy of his own, and the whole see the whole the thing here is that there's twelve guys outside, um, waiting to basically just take Cole to the Black Hats. 
the whole thing was like to to initiate him or to just bring him into the other side to convince him to come over to the other side. Hawk has realized that the Black Hats, they're also, he was playing both sides to realize, I mean, keep your enemies close and all that, right? So he started realizing that it's like, if we were to take down the department and the Black Hats would rise up, what would that mean basically the whole five years later? It would not be a good thing. Their whole agenda would, he doesn't say it outright, but it would basically be an all fucking right like movement to, to initiate that kind of push for their own quote unquote better America. But meanwhile, maybe the department isn't as safe as we're all making it out to be keeping like the world safe and all that with all these conspiracies. What if the department has actually been trying to push these conspiracies as we kind of tend to make up in our own silly minds that maybe our government is kind of working against us? But why would they do that? Because maybe there has been two Lee Harvey Oswalds this whole time and we ended up picking off the wrong one, the good one. And the guy running the and the guy running the department right now is this weird evil tulpa that that was this like made up illusion of the evil Lee Harvey Oswald, and yeah, and then we got the wrong one, and it's like, oh fuck, oh my god, okay, I'm into it, I'm buying all into this, okay, but what does this all mean? Why are we still here? Um, and since like obviously we're gonna say Cole to the black hats, no, inside the other room was the star faced man that haunted Cole from the very beginning. And Cole has pretty much like, he he was going to do a fucking thing of it. He was going to b- blast Cole into like the news and almost like not splash the conspiracy out there. But he realized what this evil entailed and he was not going to let this monster go. So that's why he kind of almost like kept Cole under wraps and never bothered to really help him. Um, so now the plan is give Cole a gun, shoot Hawk in the, uh, in the shoulder and take, the the monster to the department and just like milk it for all the information that it is and also just like the whole thing with uh with lee harvey also to try to try to get around that and see if that's true so pretty much like everything's like like the whole the whole thing is like hitting the fucking fan right now and uh, oh man i'm just i'm buying into all of it and i fucking love it (laughs) so now it's gonna next the next issue is probably gonna just be cole and this monster around him and that's never really happened it's always been like we're talking about it around it is it there what does it really mean but it's never actually been here and i'm so excited for the, the next issue i'm really kind of scared for the next issue <laughs> and probably time for, for the, the actual october issue too so ah uh, fucking it. the department of truth is just so goddamn good and then and if that's so and if that is uh, true with like the whole evil lee running in like the way it makes sense i know i'm like just like summarizing it like not doing a service right now but it does pay off to the third issue that third issue was still kind of like that haunting one where it's like it'll make or break you like if you're going to continue or not because it was just like very pushy Mm -hmm. um but uh but yeah but now with coming back into this issue it kind of makes sense on like why i was almost like feeling that that hauntedness from then it just it was a good payoff but i hate i hate saying that so i kind of want to take it back (laughs) nice all right and we have some shared yes books uh, so let's start with crossover number eight. Ooh, okay, wow! Long break for crossover. <laughs> hey, do you want to rec- uh, previously in crossover? Do you want to recap really quick? <laughs> oh my god! Okay, <laughs> thank you for reminding me. Okay, <laughs> Donny Cates is the biggest troll in comics. I love it. <laughs> uh, but, okay, so written by Donny Cates, drawn by Jeff Shaw, colored by Dean Cunniff, and lettered by John J. Hill. <laughs> so, literally. For those who haven't seen it yet, it says previously, previously in crossover, and then you turn the page, and it's every page of the comic <laughs> crossover, very, very tiny. This such a troll. I literally I went pay, like li- like not try, I didn't try to read it, but I literally went by each by. I was like, yeah, that happened, that happened, that happened. Oh wow, cool. <laughs> Honestly, I kind of needed this, so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, what a troll. I love it. So, and then he trolls um, us more. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so we go into the story, and um, it's it, it's done in that like fourth wall breaking style where it's like, first of all, he apologizes for that Chip Zdarsky thing, <laughs> like which I thought was great, and it's just I I I got unaccustomed to crossover, and I needed to like readjust to the fact, oh, there's gonna be a billion references in this book, yeah. So, I had to sit and like actually look at it and like pick it apart and stuff. So I love it because it's basically the first part of the book is a pitch. This is what's going to happen with the story. And they're like, oh, try again. Write that again. <laughs> like, this is bullshit. Like, yeah. So um, 
Yeah, I, but we get back into the story, and we get back to our main characters, and we get the reappearance of our characters from uh, Powers. Yeah. Dina and Christian, who I love. So, again, loving seeing that. I would love to have a Powers reboot. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> uh, or a new series. And, yeah, our, our whole big crew kind of gets knocked down into, like, to basically the main two, like it, it, we, because we had a big group for a while, uh, but now it's down to Ryan and oh god, what's her name? Oh, god, Ellie. I can't Ellie, thank you. Ryan and Ellie are pretty much the only characters in the main group that we have left. Um, and it, it's kind of taking a turn of, to Ryan's direction. Like it's it's about Ryan really in this issue <laughs> right now. Yeah, yeah, and. He basically, they basically get arrested again by the powers people and they're, they're bringing them in and they're just like, Hey, we need you to talk to somebody who might have a lead, but he'll only talk to you. It's like, why? And it's like, Oh, and it was, it's Ryan's dad, the asshole preacher that caused him to burn down the comic book store. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, it was kind of a deep dive back into to crossover. I had to go back and actually read the last issue to remind myself of everything that happened a bit. But <laughs> yeah. really good. I mean, it's just as good as ever. It's just got that that edge to it of being like very self aware and doing that sex criminals thing where they're very like much breaking the fourth wall and oh totally wink the, wink nudge nudge at the audience. You know, the whole so. uh, double page spread of like yeah this could this could have been really cool right and just like <laughs> again they're giving us the characters that we've been wanting to see happen in canon so we can say that it happened but it's in this stupid legal pad sketch and it's like yep. we just have to say that we think it's them but it's like fuck you <laughs> Donnie <laughs> I love it it's fucking crazy it's so good yeah I love it alright so that takes us to uh, let's go to Adventure Man okay Speaking of long breaks, <laughs> yes, a very Finally, long. This break. book is back, uh, and they actually they talk about why at the end of the book. It's it's mm-hmm. obviously very understandable, but um, so Intervent, Adventure Man number five, created by Matt Fra- Fraction and Terry Dodson, with the script by Matt Fraction, pencils and colors by Terry Dodson, inks by Rachel Dodson, letters by Clayton Cowles. Um, I just, I forgot how much I enjoyed this book. Me too, dude. I mean, it's like, I knew I loved it, but it's like that why it's like, what was that? What was that? It's so fucking charming, dude. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's got that old pulp hero, that rocketeer. Yeah. Sky Captain, the world of tomorrow feel. And like, and I don't want to say steampunk because it's not steampunk. It's beyond steampunk. There's, mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a step after that. And the word is, is not coming to me, but I, the thing I love most about this story is, um, well, I, first of all, I think it's funny that this is the end of the first arc, and we waited like months to end the first arc. I was like, man, you think the new arc, you know? But whatever. <laughs> um, but my favorite thing about this is the future. Yes. Um, so basically, we we spent the whole first arc learning about Adventure Man and his group of friends and stuff like that, and. Me and Josue were like, wow, she has a really big family and they all have like really cool specialties. And we're like, they're getting powers, aren't they? (laughs) And we kind of called that from issue one. And now it seems like they're going to be teaming up with her as Adventure Man and they're going to be a new adventuring party. Yeah, I honestly, I I, I didn't even see the whole powers thing. It's like they're they're all like super proficient in their own fields. And it's like, yeah, or something like let's use that. But now we're just going to like up up the ante with like since like now we have a blend of two worlds or it's like a, a world that's like unveiling itself. Um, and I, but I do love that the, that the sisters are like as smart as, and they, as smart as they are, they're also just being cautious. Like, yeah, we're not just going to yeah. pump this into our body. Let's think about this. So it's like, it's, I'm, yeah. I'm so excited. I'm so glad it's back. I know it's just great. And just the art is obviously it's Terry Dodson and Rachel Dodson. Oh, totally. The killer yes. team and the coloring, which by the way, the colorist doesn't get enough credit because they're not listed as the colorists in the book. Mm. Um, it's Leonardo Olea who does the design. They also do the coloring. Oh, okay, cool. Um, nice. So, um, but yeah, it's just, it's just so great. I love it. It's muted when it needs to be. It's just, and just dots and art dots and art's perfect. There's nothing wrong with that ever. So, right. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about, we're going to turn our books sideways. Boop. Talk about echo lands Two. Uh, creative team, J H Williams, the third and W Hayden Blackman. Are they co-create and co- co-write? J. Williams the third does the art and design. Dave Stewart the colors and Todd Klein the lettering. Um, this 
for those who don't remember, this is the the one done in like a landscape style that Image put out recently. This book is awesome. And yeah, it's it's really cool. It's definitely I, I really enjoy it, but it definitely seems like a Josue book. So I wanted to kick to you first and get your opinion of what, what was going on and everything. So <laughs> it's just like like the, the SpongeBob scene when uh when Patrick and SpongeBob just like glue their eyes on a map and they just go everywhere. That's literally me on this book. I just like I love gawking at every single part of this book. The story still is kind of still piecing itself together, but man, like the whole landscape format of it all, I just like I love where I can just like I'm feeling like I'm feeling I'm feeling like I'm reading comics in a new way, and because goddamn, do we read so many fucking comics? <laughs> just a simple flip like this just does so much for me, and the the art, just like the fact that art is just like out of this fucking world, it's just it's so badass. So yeah, no, like God, how can it, can you piece the story a little bit, uh, a little bit for me? <laughs> okay, yeah. So um, it's just set in kind of like a mismatch, mis- mishmash fantasy world, mm-hmm. and but it's it's got obviously details of our world too. So you'll get little hints. Like I think the best way to look at it is when they, when the robot they find in the sewers that part's so funny scans them all. Yeah, and. Um, it basically gives you an idea of like the world you're dealing with. So I'm pulling it up right now. Like for instance, um, they scan the one dude, uh, Homeland Genghis with a question mark. So mm-hmm. that tells me like, okay, like there's, that's going to be like one of the worlds. And then like the Nassau islands and Mythwood. So there's like, you know, but like Nassau islands, that's like a real thing. That's, that's like something in our world, but Mythwood obviously isn't. There's like old Chicago and you know, like, right. Yeah, so like it, it's just this excellent blending with with a pretty big cast. Um, so I'm kind of worried about the cast because <laughs> they're a little too big. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's just like this fantasy epic with following this group of people who are just trying to survive. And the art is um, it's really precise. Uh, there's a word and I can't think of it off the top of my head, but it's 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 a very European style. It's very precise. Everything is very in depth and everything. One thing I absolutely loved, I don't know if you noticed this, but um the pirate. Yeah. Do you see he's not in focus? Everybody else is in focus. Look at this group shot right here. See this group shot? Look at that page. Ooh, okay. Everybody else is in focus except him. Oh shit, you're right. Yeah, that's one of the visual key- keys I noticed. Even oh, in right. the big Even shots, the this big ones. close-up, he's completely out of focus. He, he is a good He doesn't style. have sharp edges. Everybody else oh, does. Oh, you're so right. Yeah, he's drawn differently than everybody else, which is very interesting. What does that mean, you know? I know, yeah. So, yeah, we're building a world where things are... Things are so different that it's going to take a couple issues to really get into it. But the, but the key to it is, it's a group of people trying to survive in this world that we're being introduced to, uh, similar to stuff like the walking dead, you know, here's a group of people, the rules, but that's an easier one. Cause we know zombies really well, you know, but this is going to introduce a whole fantasy world. So I think it's just basically think of it as a survival story right now. Yeah. And we'll get introduced to characters and we'll probably lose a few and you know, it, it'll get deeper. I really appreciate the, um, that Oracle in the end. Oh yeah, that well that oh god the 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 enemy is terrifying for the record. Mm-hmm. Like the one that's chasing them, that's just one of the scariest things I've seen in a long time. Um, but no, I was gonna say I, re- I really like the the main character and how her powers like she she revealed she could basically explode somebody with her mind. Right. Yeah, that was crazy. Like yeah, it's just we're slowly building. I think it's just a good slow build, and we're gonna really enjoy it. Um, I was wondering, did you happen to look at the music playlist? At the end? Oh my god! I, yeah, exactly again. Like the last list was just the last list was so vast. It's like, oh, I mean, like that's like that's like enough music for like the project. Mm-hmm. No, but you, you, again, like you go back and you realize the amount of detail and like every single page into a panel into a person. And yeah, no, I would be stuck, not stuck there, but I would be enjoying albums upon albums upon albums upon double albums of music too so it's really cool to actually tell us uh all of the stuff that they've been listening to just making this comic 
Yeah, and it's just really cool because some jump out at me is like things. Obviously, I think of you, uh, like King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Yeah, you know, and stuff like that. A girl walks home at night. The soundtrack, you know. I actually, just noticed the the Kurt Viley piece. I was like, fuck yeah, we just shot him out on the on the last episode. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, really cool. I, I'm enjoying it. Um, yeah, and they're also. I think they're going to do a rock cut edition where it's like the the print version. It's larger. So Ooh, you can cool. see it better. I have one of those for something else. But I have one for a uh, private eye that is in this, in this uh, format as well. Oh, nice. But yeah, from, really uh, cool. I'm, BKV. Yep. I'm definitely digging it. So it's time. Oh boy. Okay, Keith. <laughs> we know. So we have to say goodbye to an old friend. Yes, we do. It's been with us as long as me and Josue have been friends. We've been reading this comic. <laughs> That's so true. Very, very true. <laughs> so, Published by Image Comics, written by Karen Gillen, drawn by Stephanie Hans, and letter by Clayton Cowles. Die 20. Oh, man. It certainly came to an end, <laughs> like, is yeah. what I'll say. Um, a lot happened. We're, it's not a recap kind of thing. We're not going to recap what happened in this book. Let's go with how we feel. I think that's the best way to talk about this book. I think for the most part, every character ended up where they should have ended up. And I appreciate the, each arc each person had. Mm -hmm. I think what happened to Chuck was inevitable. Yeah. As we, as we knew. Yeah. So that was good. Um, I, Matt was amazing. Yeah, that moment was great. Oh my god, uh, like so good. Um, <laughs> I'm curious to see what where Ash goes from here. I know I was here. I, I would I would have just maybe have like another answer like that for, from that one. But we had such a big moment. We had a, such yeah. a big issue last issue that I feel like we should know what the next step would be. Yeah, yeah, um, and. Oh, it's so good. It's hard not to spoil this book. Um, <laughs> Saul, obviously, is the talking point. This is Saul's issue. Yeah. It's the first issue, really, that's Saul's issue. Yeah. And we find out the secret of die, kind of. What am I what, for? What am I for? You know, and just like going back in time, laying out the entire thing from the beginning, how it got here was really interesting and i really enjoyed it i've god it's okay it's an amazing 20 issue run so let's just yeah. get let's just sum up the series while we're mm -hmm. here it's an amazing 20 issue run if you like fantasy books this is a book for you if you like some of the best art in comics this is the <laughs> book for you um just if you like tabletop games this is a book for you. God, I love it. Oh, sorry, take over. I, I, I'm trying right, to like, one last thing for my final question. What did your dungeon master heart like feel like just closing the book? Like as a dungeon master, like no, no, no spoilers, but like, you as a personal dungeon pro dungeon master. Um, because it wasn't your conventional ending. It wasn't just like let's tie up everything and then everything extra and then everything afterwards. It was just like here's the thing with tabletop campaigns. A lot of them stop. Not mm -hmm. a lot of them end. Okay. Groups fall apart. You know, yeah. you rarely get to the ending, and you you really have to have a dedicated group to do the to get to an ending to get to level twenty, as we say. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I don't know, man. I, I honestly, die to me stopped becoming about a role playing game. Oh, it was nice. just about these amazing characters. Yeah. Like even though all the all the hallmarks were still there, mm -hmm. you know the dice and the classes and all that stuff. But I was just like, I was swept up in them and swept up in Ash finding their identity and Matt dealing with these conflicting emotions and just, uh, like and Chuck, Chuck always being a piece of shit, you know. And I'm almost like, turning up. But, but like a lovable piece of shit? Like, <laughs> at the end, 
just like it's a fool's error. It is like as long as I get that name, it's like <gasps> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I loved it. it yeah, was an amazing ending. It was yeah. a good one. I it wasn't the one I was expecting. It was, I mean, like just like I thought. I mean, like I was expecting just like the the. I mean, not a. Cle- I, I didn't know what to expect for an ending like this, but like defeat the bad guy, go home at the end, and then see how we are all after that. But what we got in the explanation that we got in the end was just so much better in the essence of a story and the, the and the literal game. Mm-hmm. It just gave such a profound uh, appreciation for the tabletop game. And it was just like, honestly, I, I wouldn't have ended any other way. I wouldn't have want the ending any other way. Yeah. And upcoming in November is a Kickstarter campaign that Stephanie and Kieran put together yes. to make, to make the actual tabletop game. You think it's all the pages that we got, like all the extra pages that we got, like of all the additions, and then, well, I guess, like, and then, then well, providing, because they, the rules they, they did do, you know, like a beta. Yeah. That's the whole point. So that was them beta testing. So I think we're going to get the whole thing now. Nice. All the refined rules in. Cool. Yeah. But uh, it's, it sucks to say goodbye to die. Absolutely. Like, it's just been there, you know, the entire time. Mm-hmm. And it's just incredible. So, wow. <laughs> But pick it up if you haven't. Pick up the trades. The trades are beautiful. These hardcovers would be really fucking nice whenever they come out. Oh, yeah, definitely. The covers are always nice. So, hi, hi, hi. But moving on, because we can't mourn forever. <laughs> uh, let's talk about DC. Um, I got so many DC books this week. <laughs> so, I'm going to start with my solos, because Hosway doesn't have any. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll start with Harley Quinn, number seven. Uh, making, or, or uh, I should say, actually, uh, written by Stephanie Phillips. And making their triumphant return to the book, Roddy Rosmo. Uh, doing the art, colors by uh, Ivan Placencia, and letters by Darren Bennett. So, uh, this one actually starts off the... Um, fu- or the Fear State, excuse me, Fear State uh, arc for... Harley. And as we know, it's going to be based around Ivy. Uh, that's from our interview with Stephanie, Stephanie Phillips. So uh, it's also based around um, Keepsake, this bad guy that's stealing all these things from the other bad guys. And he's got this whole thing going on. And it's really cool. And again, we're also dealing with Harley and Kevin and their relationship. And it's still very funny while also fitting very well into. Fear State. I, I think it's going to be a really interesting angle that we're going into. And um, yeah, I, I'm just really excited. And so Bella shows up at the end and tells Harley, hey, I found Ivy. And and she has this big smile on her face. And it's really exciting. I'm excited to see where this goes as far as like its part in Fear State. A uh, few things I want to draw attention to. Um, at the beginning, Keepsake comes up with his own version of Batman's villains, including Blaine, <laughs> the polyphonist, who is uh, the trans- ventriloquist. Ventriloquist, yeah. Uh, Sage Swine, instead of Professor Pig. Oh. Exclamation, instead of the Riddler. <laughs> Fellow Frigid, which is uh, Mr. Freeze. Mr. Freeze. And then a lady who goes, did I give you a name yet? Fuck it, I'll call you Sword Lady. Because <laughs> she has a sword. So you can get an idea of what they look like. There's Blaine. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And then, halfway through the book, the other highlight that I absolutely love, because I love adorable things, is they're asked to find a missing dog who is a pug. Hmm. And uh, they're like, fine, I guess we'll find it. And so the dog's name is Waffles. And Harley has a day- daydream where it's a pug that has a waffle on its back, <laughs> which sounds delicious. Yeah. The waffle, not the pug. Um, so um, they find the pug. Here's the pug. Here's waffles. And waffles is amazing. And then waffles continues to appear in the rest of this issue in adorable ways, uh, including they're running from a bear. Yeah, this book goes there. And Harley is hanging off the side of a cliff holding onto Waffles, and she's doing like a confession thing. And that's Waffles' face the entire time she's talking. <laughs> like, and so, literally, this whole page is just like, <laughs> just Waffles' face. It's great. 
And then at the end, when they have the moment with Bella, where Bella's like, I found Ivy, we get this jubilant Harley face, this worried Kevin face, and Waffles. And Waffles, <laughs> god damn it. <laughs> so, I love it. Uh, I want a Waffles. It actually... <laughs> I have this thing where I I I've ne- I I like dogs, but I've always been really weird about getting a dog. Mm-hmm. But in this movie, I'm like, I don't want a, don't want a dog. And I was like, <laughs> no, no, bad bad thought. We have two dogs already, so they're just not mine. Um, but yeah, really great start to Fear State. I'm excited to see where it goes. Next up, Deathstroke Inc. Number one. Nice. Uh, oh, I forgot to show you my Harley cover. Deluxe cover. Oh, cool. As always. So, Deathstroke Inc. number one cover, also a deluxe cover. Cool. So, so in this book, we we found out in a previous book that Black Canary is going to be teaming up with Deathstroke, and we don't like. She's basically watching him. She's she's undercover watching him, and uh, so that's where this book takes off. And they um, they're working with a group called Trust, which is T U R T R U S T. Transparent researching united or transparent researchers united for strategy and technology. I love when comic creators try really hard to get an acronym in and make yeah. it make sense. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things. I liked in uh, Dark Rain when they just, hammer. They just had to like what but hammer they stands s- for. We'll find out later. They <laughs> never <laughs> said it. I, I hated that. <laughs> I loved that. That was the best part about it. Is they were like, it doesn't matter what it stands for. <laughs> so, um, so written by Joshua Williamson. Drawn by Howard Porter, colored by Hi-Fi, and lettered by Steve Wands. Um, so basically, they go they go attack Hive, you know the the big terrorist group, and they discover that Hive has basically taken all these people in this town and they make them incubators for their their bees, and so like these bodies are just desiccated inside. They fall over and bees come out and stuff, and they're trying to get there and they finally find the queen bee and they attack her. And there's this disturbing imagery like right here where this guy has a beehive for a head. Oh, that is cool. Little boys with the creepy <laughs> bug eyes. Love it. Like it's creepy as shit. And he has, if you can't see it on his chest, he has a spigot that has honey pouring out of it. Oh, damn. <laughs> I love yeah. that imagery. Yeah. It's creepy as shit, dude. Like I was like, what the fuck? Um, but yeah, uh, they basically, long story short, they're able to attack her, knock her out, and they take her captive. But then Black Canary has a moment with uh, with Deathstroke to be basically be like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing the right thing? And he does this. I'm dying. And she goes, what? And he goes, I got gotcha. you. I've never been healthier. <laughs> like, like, he's like, basically, he's just like, I've been a good guy. Or I've been a bad guy. I've been a good guy. It's time for me to pick a side, basically. Ooh, okay. And I was like, oh, cool. I like that. So. I like that. Being adding Black Canary as a moral compass to decide this is a is, is a cool, yeah. cool pair. And then I liked the last page they gave us three completely out of context panels from up, upcoming episode issues, <laughs> which is great. I'm very excited. So good stuff, good start. I, I like Deathstroke Inc. already. So next up, Detective Comics 1043 deluxe cover. Ooh, cool. Yeah, Bruce on the bike. Yeah, it's a good shot. Okay. Um, this one has a really funny joke at the beginning. Written by Mariko Tamaki, drawn by Dan Mora, colored by Jordi Belair, and letter by DT Bittacar. So this dude is like talking to his friend who's driving a car, and he's like, uh, have you ever heard of Ophius uh, cordyceps fungus? And he's like, no. He's like, all right. So an ant, it steps in a bit of fungus, right? Like stepping in gum, except the junk gets inside the ant's skin. The guy's like his exoskeleton. It's like, right, right. It's like, so it starts eating the ant from the inside, eats him until he's half, half, or uh, eats up half his body. Then he takes over its brain. He goes this whole thing of like this, this fungus taking over uh, uh, ant's corpse or uh, ant's body, right? Mm-hmm. And he's like, and then he's fucking dead, and the fungus grows out of it and shoots out of his head, and poof, more fungus. And the dude's response is, "What the fuck? This happened to your ant?" He goes, "Fuck ants, bugs. It's a bug." <laughs> I was like, such a great joke. Like, I was like, what? what? I was thinking it was like one of those cliche, like sometimes, especially Batman or the like, the street level heroes will have the bad guys having a conversation like that, uh-huh. and then ties directly into what's going on. Oh, okay. I'm, always, I'm always really bothered by that. This one's just stupid, and I loved it. <laughs> um, but this is mad. The magistrate taking over the the city, basically. Okay. And uh, the mayor is doesn't really trust the magistrate really well. And 
there's an in, basically he almost dies, and it's almost like implied that the magistrate would like him to be dead mm-hmm. to make it easier. And in the end, of all people, Bruce is trying to save him. Uh-huh. So Bruce Bruce uh, saves him like they're in the sewers hiding and stuff. Um, but at the end, the mayor finds the new eggs for Hugh Vile, the guy that was infected by the parasite. Mm-hmm. He finds these eggs with these parasites growing inside. Oh, shit. Oh, damn. So, yeah. And then it says, next, vile spawn. So, oh. Like, great. You <laughs> <laughs> vile was creepy. It was weird. So, good stuff. Love that. Um, next up, Checkmate, number four of six. Hmm. I did not get the Deluxe cover because I just really like this cover. Superman just wrecking shit. So. Yeah, hell yeah. Uh, written by Brian Michael Bendis. Art by Alex Maleev. Color by Dave Stewart and letter by Josh Reed. I saw a funny tweet. Someone said, uh, basically, like, because Superman's gone right now in DC continuity. Mm-hmm. And they're like, is, is Bendis just going to do what he wants and just keep using Superman? <laughs> Which I was like, that's pretty funny. <laughs> like, um, This one, of course, is the fight between the two uh, spy organizations. Uh, which is, of course, Checkmate, which are the good guys, and um, Leviathan, which are the ostensibly bad guys. And, yeah, it's just kind of building up the tension of that. Uh, They're really, like, hammering home how how important Lois Lane is to this. There's this really cool double spread of her and Clark in the uh, Fortress that I really like, the Fortress of Solitude. I love when DC does dialogue panels like that, or dialogue pages like that. But, yeah, it's just really cool. We also found out a couple issues ago or I think it might have been last issue that Talia is a triple agent and is actually betraying them. That's right. Yeah. We think mm-hmm. <laughs> who knows with her. Cause you were bummed out about that. <laughs> yeah. They kind of hinted at it a bit. So, um, but Lois finds a message from her father. Ooh, uh, they kept saying like the snowman ticket. That's like the code they used. Hmm. And he had a little snowman statue and she realized that the head opened, you could pull something out ah. and there is a birth certificate in there. For someone named Leonardo Lane. Huh. Father's name, Samuel Lane, which is Lois Lane's dad. Yeah. She has oh. a brother. Oh, shit. Yeah. So that's kind of hinted at. They don't really, like, they literally show that and then cut away. We don't go back to them. So <laughs> there's also a pretty funny moment that I really liked um, where uh, they're talking about what the checkmates talk about what they're going to do. And they're like talking about the bad guy from Leviathan. Like, hey, let's just kill him. <laughs> And then Green Arrow's like, yeah, Talia, go take him out. <laughs> and they're just like, yeah. And then uh, one of them says, hey, there's a kid in the room. And then <laughs> Director Bone says, it's Batman's kid. He's like, but still. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then, like, what was it? Damien says, I'm not offended by the lack of morality. I'm offended by the dumbness. <laughs> so, yeah, I love Damien. So we'll talk about him later. Um, yeah. But yeah, they get attacked. There's this awesome double page spread of an attack scene, a fight scene. Ooh, cool. Yeah, which oh, is nice. really cool. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, it, it leads off. We still got two issues left in the series, so I'm curious to see where that goes. Next up, Icon and Rocket, number three. Hmm. Uh, so this one is one of those milestone books, along with Static. Icon and Rocket, of course, is the uh, superhero from another world who traveled here and his rocket landed and he's raised by normal human beings but he's black in this case so, ah. uh, yeah but he's and I, I just love icon i've always have like he's just great um in this one uh he's written it's written by original hudlin pencil by doug braithwaite inked by andrew curry and colored by brad anderson with letters by anvil and in this one we find out kind of about the two things the big the big focus is this one the first one is we find out that they decide to take their war on drugs to the drugs. So they go to Colombia and burn all the fields and they go to (laughs) Afghanistan and stop people from making poppies. And like, they're doing all this. They're like, we'll just cut off the drug supply. Yeah. Well, then the government's upset because it actually fucks the, the whole economy up because the economy depends on an illegal drug trade being there at least a little bit. Of course. Because people have to sell mansions and expensive cars and, and like, they point out Florida funnels so much uh, money, like laundry, laundering money mm-hmm. through the banks that the banks aren't making enough money and stuff. Oh. So like, well, we need a little bit of a drug trade. So they're upset with Icon for this, basically, <laughs> which is ridiculous. And I Very. Um, and then, and he knew it was going to happen. That's the other thing. He's just like, this is what's going to happen. Like, and they're going to be mad. <laughs> um, the other thing it focuses on is the other alien that came to Earth, which is like a shapeshifter type mm. 
and it um it's it almost it's the one that almost killed Icon before, and now they're sending after him again. And the first thing they do is send it after Rocket's mom. And uh, there's just this awesome reveal. I'm not gonna. I'm, I don't want to spoil it because I want people to read it. But I'll show this way. The mom is about to die with the shapeshifter dude, and this lady comes running. And she's like, "I'm her lawyer," and then she jumps up like several stories. Oh jumps shit! Through the window. Uh huh. And then shows up with a sword. <gasps> oh, dope. Okay. You can kind of guess where that's going. Uh huh. Like if Icon is, yeah. <laughs> so, um. But it's really, really dope. She's, I, she, it, it tells me they're probably going to expand mm-hmm. the um, milestone stuff a bit. I really hope so. So, but yeah, I really dug this. I'm just, I love the. It does give me again. I've, I've talked about it before. The Wolverine Jubilee vibes, kind of like yeah. what we're reading in uh, X Men Legends right now. That's right. Yeah, and um, just Icon's fun. Uh, he, I like that he's been around way longer than Superman, so he's smart about it. Mm-hmm. There's um. There's a part where Rocket calls a guy a redneck, and, he, and later he tells her he's like, "You didn't need to call him something like a racist thing," and she's like, basically like, "Fuck him," and he's just like, they basically have a discussion of like, how do you counter racism? And it was really interesting because he's just like, "I've been doing this for a long time. Like, I, I was a slave. I was an actual slave. You Fuck. get that, right? Like, like so. It's just really interesting. I was like, this is deep. Like, I really dug that. So." All right, last solo DC, I promise. Ruby Justice League number six, written by Marguerite Bennett, penciled by Emanuelo Pacino, uh, inked by Wade von Grabadger, still best name in comics, um, colorist by Hi-Fi, and lettering by Gabriella Downey. Uh, so basically, Ruby and the Justice League take the fight to Starro, and they attack Starro deep in the, the ocean. They send Diana out there to draw him out because Diana isn't actually a real person. She's a construct, so uh-huh. she can't be taken over. Well, they're doing a pretty good job, and they're fighting them. And Jade shows up, and Jade is OP, and she basically, you know, she's awesome. But then Starro grabs a hold of her and takes over Jade. And now Jade's on the other side. And then all these people, everyone starts seeing people they know in, like, green illusions. So, Ooh, okay. Yeah, so, and Bruce is... <laughs> Bruce sees his parents shot and killed, which is just, of course, of course, the pearls are there, Yeah, <laughs> which is just funny to me. So, um, but they retreat and they go to a dust hanger. Dust is like the energy stuff in Ruby. Mm. It like has magical powers and they literally just pick the thing up and hurl it at Star. <laughs> like, so it's basically like a bomb factory. They just threw a bomb factory at it basically. So. And then it cuts suddenly. It cut really quickly suddenly. Next, The Conquered. So mm. I don't know if the next one's the last issue or we'll have one after that. We'll see. But pretty cool. I love the cover because it's got the Ruby version of Aquaman. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's just really dope. Deluxe cover again. All right, now we have some shared DC. So we can start on those. Let's start with Lock and Key slash Sandman Universe Helgon number two. Yes. Uh, creative team uh, written by Joe Hill art by Gabriel Rodriguez colors by Jay Fotos letters by Sean Lee uh, so I reviewed the first issue very briefly when we first got it um, Josue hadn't had a chance to read it at that point so what do you think of like this in addition to like the first issue your, your overall idea so far uh, well it was kind of like um, an in between chapter that I just hadn't really um Red, this uh, this two parter is basically the second part to the In Battalions Go that Joe Hill did for just Lock and Key because like it just really like getting this ending now it does it does such a great job of having those three issues and now I can definitely see like the trade planned out those three issues and then plan it out with this like little Sandman crossover and have this little uh, closed off so that one's really cool just like and like the way it incorporated uh, how to crossover both worlds like hey you borrow these i'll borrow let me borrow those really quick mm-hmm. and then it works like like I, I love the fact that they got permission to allow this crossover to happen just because they both just bend reality and rules to where it's just like you you can't really tell you can't really deny it from happening happening especially when the when the continuity fits with like when morpheus is kind of trapped for, for that whole almost century so so I, I definitely liked it and then like 
getting to, to this one, number two, and then just having kind of like all those like family interactions, it just made and battalions go so, so worth it to read. Like it was, it was a good payoff. Nice. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed it. It's a great companion piece to Sandman. Yeah. Um, and being as somebody who has Sandman volume two audiobook queued <laughs> up and ready to go and just can't get up the, I, I know I'm not going to sit down long enough to enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like I want to sit for hours and I just don't have a moment and I really want to listen to it, but <laughs> it's there for me. Um, I love flapper death. Yes. Flapper style death. That was, that was the look. I loved that. So, but yeah, just a good fun two parter. And, um, it really expands both worlds really well. I think that's cool. Mm-hmm. Like, sometimes when you have a crossover, one of the two properties, it's kind of like is stretching to fit the other. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, no, totally. So when they do a crossover that actually works, I'm like, Oh, that's dope. You know, that, that makes sense. So, um, I'm trying to think of like the ones I re- like, like Superman Gen 13, I thought was perfect. I thought it was like balance of both of them. Uh, I really like the old Teen Titans X Men run back in the '80s. That was a really good uh, issue. Ooh, okay. So, um, but yeah, sometimes it's like not Spawn Batman, but Batman Spawn because we're two different crossovers. <laughs> yeah, Batman Spawn I didn't like. That's what I'll say. So, right. <laughs> I just felt like it was like these characters should not be in the same world. They don't really match, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just the edgy '90s that just allowed it to happen. Yeah. So. And also like that, like this one, like yeah, where it's it's mostly a lock and key story. So how are we, how are we gonna how are we gonna incorporate the Sandman story without just like having the characters sprinkled around? I I like that that's that, that the solution ended up being more of a Sandman solution, like like mm-hmm. like pretty much like everything that ha- how they how they fight Lucifer and then how Lucifer quote unquote wins slash loses was such a Sandman type of like plot, you know? It's like in. The first volume when he rap battles that demon. <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, that's great. I love that. So, uh, and and for the record, I know it wasn't a rap battle, but to me, that will always be a rap battle. Yeah. Oh, totally. That, that actually just makes the scene so much better for me. <laughs> All right. Next up, DC Black Label. We're going to talk about Batman versus Big B the Wolf, a wolf in Gotham. Yeah. Um, written by Bill Willingham, writer and creator of Fables. Uh, art by uh, a very variety of people. Brian Lovell, Jay Leistein, and Lee Lowridge doing the colors and lettering by Steve Wands. Um, me and Josue are both really big fans of Fables. Yes. Uh, it's one of the best comics ever made. Fight <laughs> Me. Oh, I, that's one I should tell Jessica about next time. Oh, that'd be great. But she would dig it. So, anyways. Um, this is a crossover and this is it's funny because we just talked about Sandman. Yeah. <laughs> um I don't know if these two really match well, kind of based on what I was saying, but it was done well enough. You know what I mean? Well like, enough. Uh, this issue, I mean, like it's more like this issue just f- leaned on one side more than the other. I feel like we didn't get enough Big B. Like really really at all. Yeah, I think that's kind of like the way it was supposed to be though, you know. So mm-hmm. um I, uh, uh, I I'm enjoying it quite a bit. I uh, hmm. what Robin is this? I was so confused. Because uh, then okay. he calls because then, then he says Stephanie and Tim are already en route. So which Robin is this? Is this like not a dead Jason? Um, I. Th- so my thought was it was Dick. Okay. And, um, but I don't think. Dick ever went back to being Robin, right? After Tim was there, but I mean, it's an it's an Elseworlds story, you know. I know. I mean? like, it's just like he looks like super big. Like I mean, like it's like it's one of the guys, you know. Like, it's like I don't think it's Damien. Yeah, no, it wouldn't be. Um, also, uh, so we know Tim is the one because Tim has a hood on in this, and that Tim's the only one that ever really wore a hood except for Damien. Uh huh. So, um. I don't know, man. Uh, I, I think it's supposed to be Dick, but again, like I said, it's just, it's an else world. It's fun, you know. Oh yeah, no, it's a much, you know. it's a much more different, borderline playful Batman. Like this Bruce is kind of different already. You can definitely see the Fables influences. Yes, um, specifically with the group, you know, the group, the antagonist, the spotlight Yeah, but with, like 
specifically with them being named after different writers, mm-hmm. Mr. Salinger and uh, Mr. Austin and stuff. Like right. That. So I thought I think that's it. That's 100% a Bill Willingham thing to do. Yeah, totally. Um, I do think it was a Batman story until the very end when we, when we got big B, but I think, I think big B is going to be like the next issue is going to be big B's you more know? focused on him. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, I was just waiting to see. Like, I don't how like hard. how easily Batman dropped Bigby. That bothered me. I know. <laughs> I was like, see, that's another thing with crossovers. I'm kind of like, mm, that one. And then. Right. We, we like, get like, well, actually, that really wouldn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> who would win the fight? It's who the writer wants to win the fight. That's how it works. So. But yeah, it's cool. Um, more fables always. It's always. Cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just, um, you know. Stay away from Comic Skate, please. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> like, yeah, I was kind of worried about that please. one for a little bit. Anyways, mm-hmm. but yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Um, next up, we're going to talk about Robin number yes. six, one of the highlight DC books right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got the I got the deluxe book cover. Oh, that's a good one. Holy shit, nice. Yeah. So, creative team written by Joshua Williamson, drawn by Gleb Melkinoff, colored by Luis Guer- Guerrero, and lettered by Troy Pateri. So we had this whole adventure with Damien where he went and talked to his grandfather and he, he had a rooftop race with the Robins and he's finally back and it's time to start the tournament. And man, does it start. <laughs> they have this awesome fight where Robin, uh, who's he? I, I went past the first round already. It's like, the first page, uh, Blue yeah, Strike. Yeah. Blue Shrike. He takes out Blue Shrike like immediately. This, this, the, he looks so cool. Like when we just snap his necks, like the way his hands are just positioned just are, after snapping it. So cool. That was cool. But even cooler was when he fought Tengu. Oh, hell yeah. And the way he defeated Tengu. This shot. Fucking hell. <laughs> like, I was like, that's one of the most violent things I've ever seen. <laughs> like, Jesus. Um, and then Damien's like, next. And they're like, dude, chill. <laughs> Wait a sec. And he gets to watch Flatline fight. And she rips out a heart. He's like, oh, is that our only move? And then they start flirting. And it was cute as fuck. <laughs> um, so Drench beat Dracon. XXL stomped out Raptor. I like how XXL just looks like a buff beast boy. Uh, totally. <laughs> so Ravager took out whatever that one to do his name. Johnny Fist uh, lost to Hawk easily. And uh, Black Swan beat Double Dare. And so Respawn is fighting Hiro. And I think he ends up winning. Well, the important part, though, is happening over to the side where um, Damien is sitting there studying everything that's going on. And um, (laughs) um, Flatline, like I said, she's flirting with him and she brings out the manga book that mm-hmm. he lost and that mean host are, are kind of fangirling over that he has a manga book i love <laughs> yeah. that um and she's like hey you lost this and then she reveals that she read it mm-hmm. and that was even funnier and so they're just sitting there flirting and at the same time watching and dissecting their enemies and figuring out what to go on she tells her story about how she's like drawn to death and she can absorb the skills of the people that you know die and it's just funny because there's the moment of Alfred, Alfred's ghost. I like this one, Master Damien. <laughs> like, yeah. I, was, I was like, I don't, I don't know if that's how he would react to that girl. <laughs> like, but um, then they're joined, of course, by Ravager and Connor. Connor with the <laughs> the shirt, man. <laughs> like, he's he's got it cut off, but it's like more than a midriff. It's like a it's a crop top, a mid and a half drift. <laughs> like, yeah. So it's just all abs sticking out. And they're basically like, hey, we're going to work together, but if we have to fight each other, that's the way it is. And uh, then we get the next round. It's going to be Robin versus Respawn, which is the ripoff of Deathstroke. Yeah. Um, Hawk versus XXL. Gee, wonder who's going to win that one. Uh, <laughs> Flatline versus Drenched. I'm assuming Flatline's going to win that. And Black Swan versus Ravager. So it looks like it's going to be a final four of Robin, Hawk, Flatline, Ravager. So which is all the little buddies. And then we'll see what's happening there. So meanwhile, at the same time, Damien's trying to figure out who mother soul is. He's doing the investigation because he's not here just to fight. It's like an actual investigation. Mm-hmm. I do love the last shot where he's reading it and you see, uh, you see his, the hook coming. Right. Over his shoulder. That was really cool. Really nice and ominous. I'm excited to see where it goes. 
Yeah, I'm too. loving this book. It's one of the best books DC puts out. We already. Oh, it's so good. I mean, like, honestly, issue five is just like has been one of the best issues of the year. It was it was so fun, and just God, it was so needed. I just I loved the it so much. Race. Oh fuck yeah! I loved it so. Good old DC Comics. Uh, so let's move on to our final publisher of the night, and that is going to be, as always, Marvel. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about some Marvel comics. Looks like he's going to start with his solos. Uh, and you know what? I'm going to change this order. Let's talk about Miles Morales first. Okay. It'll be really quick. Uh, Miles Morales, Spider-Man, uh, written by Saladin Ahmed. Artist is Carmen Carnero. Eric Arciniega as a colorist and Corey Petit as a lettering. A very quick issue. It's, of course, the classic uh, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late Spider-Man issue. In this case, Always for good. yeah, in this case for a date. So of course, uh, hilarity ens- ensues across town as he gets to his destination, and it is just hilarious. Uh, and this is when you, when you mention is like like rescuing a pug, and it's like, wait, did I read that issue? No, <laughs> Miles rescued his own pug in in his book as well. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, so and in the end, it's uh, meeting up to his date. In this case, it's uh, Starling, the oh. the vulture's uh, granddaughter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a great moment where he's just like, oh, man, uh, I don't know. When is it? Because it's a great moment how it's, how it's phrased. Shit, when it's like, same, 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 same. Oh, yeah, yeah, Sorry, I'm late. I was going to change before meeting you down here. I just got caught up in something, and then my phone died. Same and same and same and same. Because like she was like doing her <laughs> thing, too. And they have a cute moment where and pretty much it all ends up uh, them like just kissing because like, it's date night now. And then zoom out into crosshairs. And Taskmaster is the has a has a, has a, a job right now, but and the, the whole thing, uh, the whole issue was showcasing Miles's new outfit, which is actually say. which is actually pretty cool. Um, I was kind of like I, I was kind of like uh, on the fence about it at first, but now actually really like the whole thing. Like let's let's have him go across town, do in, in different uh, positions, so we can kind of get like a full scale of the suit, and it's dope. You know, like you get like the it's still like the black on red. Uh, color scheme, the mm-hmm. pants are kind of like uh, the similar, but it's more like a baggy sweater over mm-hmm. him, and it's cool because it's like it's not just like no, let's put a hoodie on him. It's more like um, a mouth. Um, I forget. What, I forget what it's, it's kind of. It's, it's basically like the someone's killing children mask, but I forget what they're called. Not a garter, but <laughs> it was gator. gator. Thank you. It, it's more like the way it, it tightens up, like like the the hoodie, the the whole the baggy sweater tightens up around the mouth, like as as a gator, and kind of. I think I have probably a little like like belt pulleys too, but no, no, like the sweater kind of climbs over. But he does have like an under an undersuit too, so I kind of like how it hangs over, and he also has pockets, so which is it's always nice to have pockets. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's a very quick issue. It's just like really showcasing that the outfit and the fact that he's still with uh, Starling. Gotcha. And happy right. tenth anniversary for Miles Morales. Yes, <laughs> which we've been celebrating with variant covers. The variant covers, yeah, uh, yeah. So I have more coming up later. So, um, all right, let's talk about it. <laughs> Amazing Spider-Man, number 74 slash 875. I had to get the Marco Cicchetto variant because fucking oh, Cicchetto. Yeah, Cicchetto, and man. The, the web shooters. I, I like the detail. I'm like, they actually uh, stick out like a lot. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. And also just reminded me of like that first arc where Spider-Man was just like, just checking Daredevil. I was like, bro, don't you dare fucking come out with that suit. <laughs> that's such a good part. Yeah. Run down the creative team for me. Yes. Uh, the creative team being not in the beginning. Okay, cool. Nick Spencer with Christos Gage as writers, writers, uh, pencilers, Marcelo Fierrera, Mark Bagley, Zé Carlos, Dio Neves, Carlos Gomez, Ivan uh, Fiorelli, <laughs> and Umberto Ramos. You guys are out of control, Marvel stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hefty issue. I know. Is that it? Uh, oh shit! Um, <laughs> that's right. Those are just the pencilers. I know that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Inkers, Wayne Foucher and Marcelo Fierrera, Andrew Hennessy and uh, Andy Owens, Zé Carlos Tia Nieves, Carlos Gomez, Ian Fiorelli, and Victor Olazaba as the inkers. Colors are Andrew Crosley, Edgar Delgado, and Alex Sinclair. And to top it all off, Joe Caramanga mastering the lettering for this whole issue. Excellent. Is this Nick Spencer's last issue? Um, yes. I, I mean, this was, this was supposed to be his finale, and then we move into the whole uh, brain trust. Uh, yep. So, 
Oh, good God. Um, so what do you think? Because you're our Spidey guy. Now, I read it. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely an ending. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, I mean, um, if I had to say for like the last few writers on Spider-Man, <laughs> the biggest Spider-Man nerd tackling actual Spider-Man has been Nick Spencer. Of course. Maybe yeah. not the best Spider-Man run of all time. But the amount of appreciation, the amount of callbacks on Rogue's storylines, and then to just, pun intended, weave them all together and have it make sense instead of just being like, oh, yeah, that, that happened that one time. Remember? No. It, yeah. This whole, this, all of these 74 plus issues just felt like it's always been tied together just through this long, crazy Marvel continuity. And. That, yeah, you just have to give that up for for Nick Spencer. He he actually achieved that instead of just making his own chapter, his own, his own next chapter into the Peter Parker Spider Man mythos. There was just like, yo, no, let, let's fucking talk about all of it and all those plot holes, and then maybe just bring up some characters that nobody's ever heard of or or, or in a while. So the culmination of all that into this was very good. I mean, like, and especially because like it focused on Spider Man at his core and. And the and the people that are and his inner circle, his tight group of people around him. Um, okay, my sounds at me <laughs> before this last issue, but at least like the, the focus and love for Harry, which is always important. Which is all, it always it, it's always felt important. It's like it was like his best friend from like forever, and then to just like make him a villain, make him not a villain, and make him this troubled basket case, make him just like this recovery uh, uh, person in recovery. To just finally, I'll, I'll not, not finally set it straight, but to just like at least set this character straight. And oh boy, <laughs> damn it, to just be ripped apart from us. No, it, it was it, it was it was really good. Uh, I really loved Harry in the in the in those all those moments. Him was like rocking the glider again, but again, mm. I'm not the bad guy. <laughs> it was just yeah. like him with the pumpkin bombs, but just like fighting for his own purpose finally, not just like. As a vendetta, as for for someone else, like hey, Harry was actually fighting, which is really, is really cool seeing that. Call back to American Son, um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, Just, it's emotional. It is. It was very emotional. There were some really emotional moments. So I got to the part where I'm not trying to avoid that big spoiler. But up until then, uh, before we get to like the ending stuff, what did you feel uh, uh, kind of like that first half of this ending? Besides, like, all that emotional, but it's like, as you're reading it, it's like, the, the, as, as for a finale, I guess. It struck me as, I think it's the first time in Spider Man history that both Harry and Norman are good guys. Yeah. So that was interesting. Um, so I got to actually emotionally invest in their relationship in a yes. way that I could actually empathize with both of them. Mm-hmm. So when what happens to Harry happens, and Norman reacts and the line like, you know, you think I was trying to make the son I always wanted. I already had him. I was like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> like, like you and me with daddy issues. <laughs> oh, like, totally. fuck <laughs> shit, dude. Like, like what the fuck, man? And so, um, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was very emotional as somebody who was a big fan, as big of a fan as there is of the, the twins. Mm-hmm. The Norman's twins quote. I like. I actually dug that story and really liked the dynamic it added to Spider-Man for a little bit. Um, it was great to see that kind of wrapped up, and the Mephisto stuff was great. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and my only concern about this book was Boomerang just died. Yeah. And then we're going to kill another one. And I'm like, I, f- I kind of feel like we're going to forget about Boomerang's awesome sacrifice. Okay. You know, so it's just kind of like. Especially when this is already a hefty book. It's not like. Yeah. Like, I'm already forgetting what just happened in that big arc right now, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, he literally died in an episode or an issue ago. Right? I think, yeah, I think so, to be honest. <laughs> so I was kind of like, that sucks, you know? Like, because I love Boomerang. And so, yeah, it'll get lost in the mix a little bit. But other than that, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, so. uh, it, it, it was just kind of worth it following these, again, 74 plus issues. I wish it would have rounded off to like a, an even 100 or at least like racked it up to like the 900. We'll, we'll see where it goes for like after this. It was actually a good setup to just like 
where can we kind of like tell these next 25 chapters for the next like combination of like the big 900, the next status quo change. Yeah. But this is just really cool. Now, I, I mean, it's, it's setting, setting it, setting it straight, setting it better, a better taste on like the, the whole twins thing. I love that. But let's come back to the, let's, let's come back to the ending, like the whole yeah. one more day thing. Are they, were they going to retcon it and everything? Did they completely rip off the band aid? No. And you know what? Oh. Oh wait, no. We need to stop for a sec because okay. we need to also acknowledge uh, Doctor Strange with his two champions. Yeah, oh yes, yes, yes. That was excellent. <laughs> so it's like Harry and Peter versus the twins, and Harry ends up dying mm-hmm. very much like his father died. By the way, yeah, uh, yeah, getting stabbed through the chest, impaled. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So and then Norman or uh, Spider Man gets buried under a bunch of rubble as he always does, which is great. But he and can't come over- out. Mephisto literally calls it out like, oh, here's the part where he lifts up the rubble, <laughs> which I was like, great. Um, but he can't. He can't do it. And then he, Doctor Strange is like, well, you have two champions. He's like, ah, oh, Harry's dead. He's like, Harry's not my champion. He wasn't it. Champions. And who saves the day but Mary Jane motherfucking Watson. MJ, so yes. Yeah, so here we go. Are they going to retcon one more day? Will we get the 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 wedding back or like at least like the marriage back together? No. We don't completely rip off the Band-Aid. What we do... Is something so much, I, honestly, a little bit cooler. Yeah. I fucking loved this whole explanation. Yes, it does touch back to the re- the, the reason on why for one more day. Why does Mephisto love to just fuck around with Peter Parker's life? Because Mephisto knows somebody know, knows something nobody else does. There's a prophesized feature where Mephisto wins, where he finally gets to rain earth on rain hell on earth and everybody's down. Everybody's dead. Except for of course, our one fucking guy, our one Spider-Man is going to be the one. And he knows this to save to throw that one last punch and save the day, ultimately save the day. Mm-hmm. So he's been trying to avoid this from happening. Like, a, like, a, like just like literally tear him out, tear him at, at any corner, any part of his life at, at possible, which is why Sp- Spider-Man has just to fuck, a, just fuck with him. Basically. Which is why yeah. Spider-Man has that beloved, like struggling life that we all want. Like, no, like, I want my happy Spider-Man, my happy Peter Parker. Yeah. Um, nothing so, ends up going right. In nothing that. ever ends up going right, which is why he tore down the, the marriage and literally teased them. With and like Parker the industries and all that, all, yeah, all, all everything, yeah. the daughter that never was never going to happen now ever again. Now, inadvertently, because of how he ended up fucking with it with him, or maybe because of Doctor Strange choosing his two champions, we might have corrected that timeline, and that is the best fucking thing ever. <laughs> I won't say the image, but it is the coolest way to do it. And I just, I love that pose. The same fucking thing, but now we've corrected the timeline. And it doesn't have to be now, but it's going to happen. And I'm just, maybe that's the issue 900 when we finally get that back. We just need to build up twenty another 25 uh, issues into it. But oh my God, it was so I, worth it. I don't think they're going to to bring the the bring it back. Mm -hmm. I think this is more of a story of it was going to happen. Yeah. Like, like their love was going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Even if you erase it, it's going to happen again. That's what I like more. I don't want them to get their memory back of the previous life they had together and all. No, I I don't like that. I just want them married again. I I don't care if they have marriage or not. They'll get married again. I think they'll just get married again. I just want them together. And I just hope this means we get Mayday Parker back because I love Mayday Parker. Yes. 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 Like, yeah, and and it's that too. I really, I really think it's like what what Mephisto was counting on. It's like oh, like maybe he wasn't counting on um, Doctor Strange having his two champions, but he was banking on having Harry come and save the day, having that be the obvious champion. And if had that gone uh, to plan, obviously he would have stayed under the rebel, and like that's how he would have won. But because Doctor Strange chose those two, the specific the her, his second champion, and then unify them to just like okay, let's just like. Let's let's correct this again. And I, I just I, I loved it that way instead of like how I was crying to just like give it to me now, give it to me now. <laughs> this is just so so much worth it. Yeah, definitely. So good run, Nick Spencer. Thank you for your service. <laughs> there was a, an epilogue of uh, a quick epilogue of um, who leaves. Um, there's a, a woman's prison, and somebody finally got out. And I'm trying to find the name. 
Elizabeth Tyne, aka Sarah Porter, aka uh, Janine uh, God- Godby. Godby. She's getting out of prison, and who is there to pick her up? Ben Riley, because we're gonna have like the Ben Riley Peter Parker scenario happening soon. So yeah. enter that, and that was literally where the actual issue ends. Oh, that's cool. So, um, that's um, uh, what's her name? Uh, she's with the Beyond Corporation in Marvel. She's an actual character. Ooh, okay, yeah. I mean, there, there was like important bits where she's gonna. They they had a relation. It's basically his kind of his MJ. Yeah, I, I kind of figured that one. So yeah, she kind of looks like MJ too. Mm-hmm. So Spider Man's got a type. There was a whole thing where she had to agree to like being released from prison, like almost there's like Amanda Waller <laughs> scenario, and then yeah, yeah. Uh, she's let out, and then Ben Riley's there to pick her up. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna move on to my solo Marvel. Cool. Star Wars number seventeen. Uh, written by Charles Soule, drawn by Ramon Rosanis, colored by Rochelle Rosenberg, led by Clayton Cowles. I got this cover. There were two covers. It looked pretty similar because it's like a dogfight of ships. Oh, I love that one, actually. Yeah, so uh, I dig this one. Basically, it's um, Vader and his TIE fighter chasing uh, Luke and his X-Wing. And they go down on like an ice planet and Luke pulls this cool thing where he's just like he like you can see like they kick up some water and he's like, holy crap, it's freezing before he can get back. That's how cold it is. That's like, cool. I have an idea. So basically he kicks up some water that lands on top of the TIE fighter and freezes it in place. Oh, cool. Oh shit. And then he flies off. Basically he's like, haha, got him. And Luke is dumb enough to think that's enough. Um, so, <laughs> uh, then we're back with the crew on the millennium Falcon. Uh, Lando, Leia, Chewbacca, and Lobot are trying to get the Millennium Falcon working again because it kind of got EMP'd, basically. And the way they do it is Lando... There's One of the best things about this series mm-hmm. has been how much they're referencing Solo as someone who loves Solo. Oh, yeah, the movie, yeah. So they're trying to fix the Millennium Falcon, and they have to crawl into a little crawl space and flip like a bunch of switches. And uh, it's like a really tiny, small crawl space. And Chewie's like, I'll go in. And Lando's like, no, absolutely not. Well, what they find out is every few minutes, this burst of energy goes because basically the ship has to release energy. Mm-hmm. And whoever's in there, if you're in there at the time, you're getting fried. Yeah. So it has to be someone who can do it quickly. Well, Chewie's like, I'll go. And Lando's like, you're not going to fit. It's built for droids. <laughs> and then... And Leia's like, I'll go. He's like, no, I'm going in. Lando's like, I'll go in. He's like, there's about 50 toggle switches that have to be checked and set in the right order. If one of them's wrong, it won't work. He's like, I know it. I know every system on the Falcon. She's an old friend. It's got to be me. Oh, oh he crawls dear. in there. He's talking to the ship. And he says, okay, girl, you know me. It's been a long time. I know Hans put you through a lot, but I'm back. I never meant to let you go, L3. Ah, like, <laughs> the one thing I hated about the movie because it's such a good part, but then I just hated everything after that. Everything that happens after that moment in the Star Wars lore, I hate that about that about that detail. Yeah, and so the energy's building up, and he's talking to her. He's like, "I know you want to fry me," and he's just like, "It's slowly building, building." And he's like, "And he's like, pull me out, Chewie," and Chewie pulls him out as he finishes, and he's like, "All right, it's done." And they're like, "Okay, great." And he's like, "I just need a minute here," and he sits there and he goes. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I know it's just like they're tying up so many great solo loose ends that I think we would have gotten more of if we'd gotten a sequel to solo. <laughs> yeah. Which we should have, but yeah, um, loved it. It was really, really good. I enjoyed it. So uh, I kind of wish that the star Wars books were getting some of the variant Marvel covers. Cause how great would a miles Morales star Wars cover be? Oh, that'd be so fun. Yeah. Like a, a stormtrooper with Miles Morales colors. But based on his color scheme, he would be rocking a red lightsaber. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. Or like a web lightsaber. Ooh. That'd be weird looking. Um, Winter Guard 2, moving on. Uh, written by Ryan Cady, drawn by uh, Jean Bazulda. Yeah. Colored by Federico Blee and lettered by Ariana Mayer. I'm not going to touch too much on this, on this one because it is a, a second issue, but it is about, you know, again, the Winter Guard, the Russian Avengers, if you will. And how Yelena Belova and Guardian basically broke in and stole some secret uh, files. And yeah, this just kind of develops each of the members of the Winter Guard pretty well. So you get to know them a little bit better. Um, you get to see uh, Parun, 
who is the Russian version of Thor, basically, is the best way to put it. He's, <laughs> he's a god of storms with a hammer and a helmet. Like, ah. it's, it's, it's Thor. Um, and at one point, he saves some people, and someone's like, is that Thor? <laughs> like, which I thought was pretty <laughs> great. Um, you see Chernobog quite a bit, who's got, like, a Venom kind of feel to him. <laughs> and uh, also a lot of Dark Star. And I was, I'm a big fan of Dark Star. Um, because she's mutant and should be on Krakoa, but she's loyal to Russia for some reason. <laughs> but anyways, they're um they're just trying to find uh, Guardian and Yelena, and they end up failing. And we find out they're going to Chernobyl next. So pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, really good book. I'm really enjoying it. I love you know me. I love these mini series that develop minor characters. Like I really liked uh, the Union and stuff like that. Like so. All right, that takes me to Black Cat number ten. First Miles Morales variant cover for the week. So I'll give you a shot of him. I actually have a really cool vest. I, I, that that yeah. should be his suit more than the one he has right now. I, know. I, I dig it a lot. Like it's just love the jacket over his suit, which is cool. But I love <laughs> it. Uh, written by Jed McKay, art by Sia Villa, color by Brian Reber, letter by Farron Delgado. Um, so as we know, Felicia is currently gathering all the people that have the Infinity Stones. Um, why? Who knows? <laughs> like she's because she's Felicia, she likes stealing things. Well, she she gave them a reason, but we don't know if that's actually the reason, mm. or is there something more going on? We also know that she pissed off Nick Fury by doing so, um, and she's confronted by of all people, Nighthawk. Oh, oh, he, he's still around. <laughs> he remembers Heroes Reborn. Ah, he's the only one that does. Okay, so he's talking to her and he. He's like, you know, she's like, how'd you get, catch me? Because he was like doing this like complicated swing. He's like, every time I would chase you, that's the route you'd use to shake me. She's like, what are you talking about? We don't even know each other. Barely, like we barely know each other. Oh. And he's like, you don't, you don't remember me? You don't remember us? Because they were together in that world. Oh, that's, oh, okay. And he's just like, it was taken from us, Felicia. The whole world was taken from us. A better world. One that made sense. Oof. And he wants to get the gems to remake Oh, it's her. Oh, yeah, and she's like, "What are you talking about?" And he starts telling her everything about herself. Like, your name is Felicia Sarah Hardy. Your mother's name is this. Your father's name is this. You like '60s television, '80s music. You like trash takeout and expensive champagne. You tell people you're allergic to mushrooms, but you just don't like them except for truffles because they're classy. <laughs> and she's like, "Who the fuck?" And it's just like, he basically says, "Yeah, well, we were together." And she's like, "Well, that's great. Good for you." <laughs> like, so, um. And then they get attacked by Fury. And Fury's like, give me them stones, bitch. <laughs> like, which is great. Um, she runs away and she runs to Odessa, who is the chick that runs the Thieves Guild that's been appearing in the other ones. And they're kind of working together and try to figure out what, what is going to happen from here. And then, see, so yeah, anyways, then it cuts to Star, who was the first person with the Infinity Stone that she, she brought in. And she's like, she has a plan of her own where she's going to do something against... Felicia herself. Uh, from what I understand, this is the end of this book. Um, oh, we're getting black, giant size Black Cat Infinity score, but from what I understand, Black Cat is ending there, which is really sad because I've loved this book. Yeah. Uh, but Jed McKay's doing other stuff, so maybe it's something to move on. Um, but it's a shame because I love Felicia. Mm-hmm. And that's really a shame. But really enjoying that book. I love the Infinities. I love that they took something like the Infinity Stones and put it with somebody like Felicia. Right, right. You know, who. Like, you wouldn't normally think of her with, with that. With the Phoenix yeah. hell no. Yeah, so. Next up is Dark Hawk number two. Also, Miles Morales cover. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, this one, written by Kyle Higgins, drawn by Juan Ramirez, colored by Eric Arcinega, letter by Travis Lanham. So, in the last one, we found out the new, uh, the new Dark Hawk is Connor Young, a basketball star. He's a teenager. He has multiple sclerosis, but now he's a superhero. <laughs> And he um, he basically is coming to grips with the fact that he is Darkhawk, but also at the same time coming to grips with his with his uh, disease, mm-hmm. his you know disorder. And one of the things is he has to give himself shots. And I actually one of my friends growing up was a, one was a severe diabetic, so he had to give himself insulin shots. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting to see this him trying to come to grips with the fact that he has to do this and how much it hurts. And you know, basically, you have to stab yourself every day and that's fucked up you know that's a fucked up thing to do to your head and so he ends up crying and like like talking about how it hurts and his dad's holding him while he's crying and then his buddy who in the last issue 
we saw Derek, by the way, mm. um, is one of the bad guys, is one of the people robbing Yeah. Guys. Uh, they're talking, and Derek's like, "Hey, let's go get these shoes." And they're they're some brand like Permo, and they're like limited edition the kind of shoes you have to be in line for mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And he's like, "Dude, those are expensive." He's like, "Oh, I got it." He's like, "You were just complaining how you had no money," and he's just like, "No, nah, man, I'll, I'll I'll float it for you. I got a gift card for my birthday or something." Huh. And it's kind of like it's it's interesting because I thought it was going down a certain angle, and again, it kind of it, it's Kyle Higgins, so it kind of reminds me of Radiant Black, and that it went a direction and then took a left turn on me real quick. Hmm. So it seems like oh, he's going to be the bad guy, he's going to be the good guy. They're not going to know. We're going to get a Spidey Harry Osborne thing for a while, you know? Um, no. Um, <laughs> so some guys mug them for their shoes. Dark Hawk shows up, stops them, and then he's like, "Hey, I saved your stuff, man." And then Derek pulls out a gun and tries to shoot Darkstar. Oh, shit. And he's like, you know, uh, one way there, he's like, Derek, don't. He's like, how do you know my name? And he finds out immediately that the dude is Darkhawk. He takes his helmet off. So it's not going to be drawn out for 10 issues, which is great. And he finds out what it is and stuff. He's just like, you're robbing stores and all this stuff. And then, of all people, oh, we, we see a tease of him out of costume earlier. But then Miles Morales actually shows oh, up. Oh, cool. And he's just like, hey, you guys okay? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. So Derek, his friend, is just like, you know what? I can't do this. I can't fight my friends. So he goes to the big bad guy boss and it just basically tells him, hey, I can't do it for you. Because they want, they want to steal the Darkhawk amulet. He's like, I can't be the guy to do that for you. And the boss is like, oh, really? He's like, oh, that's what, what a shame. And then they shoot Derek. What the fuck? Oh, my God. Like, you see that right there, right through the chest. Kyle Higgins just He's loves... bleeding out, and they shoot him again. Kyle Higgins just loves killing friends. <laughs> I know, man. So I was like, fuck, what? <laughs> like, so Darkhawk's getting an even more tragic backstory Damn. now. Like, so, but really good. I'm really enjoying that. Uh, I just, again, side characters. I love a good establishment of a side character. Yeah. All right, shared books. Let's go. Amazing Fantasy 3. Ooh, okay. I love how these books look like pulpy fantasy books from like the eighties and seventies. On the covers, on yeah, bands. like so good, it makes me happy. And it's got like you know taglines on the cover, mm-hmm. like "Oh, look out for this" and stuff. So, um, so creative team on this one. Uh, I'm trying to find it, but it's pretty easy. There we go. Car Andrews handles writing and arting. Brian Reber coloring. Joseph Bino lettering. Uh, this is where everything kind of is about to hit the fan. Uh, <laughs> all these different forces are coming together. Uh, Spider-Man keeps getting flirted with by the the, the girl. Yeah. Uh, Captain America's teaching the women how to fight. Uh, and Natasha is being Natasha, which is great. Um, and just, yeah, it's just really cool. And this is probably the first time we won't have a lot to say about this one. Yeah. Uh, my only thing I just actively didn't like about this is how little we got of chibi storm i know it's such a great <laughs> we were like, last oh. time <laughs> yeah and then we just got like two pages and i was like boom more chibi storm <laughs> so but it was really cool done it, it's really well done and it's very much like again it the covers like this but it is one of those traditional fantasy like like zines almost mm-hmm. that people would put together back in the 70s with jungle stories and stuff like that. And that's kind of what it feels like. And I really like it. It's just starring characters that we like. So I dig it. what do you think? Uh, for this one, yeah, I, I like the, the culmination of like, Oh, like everybody's finally getting together instead of like, are we telling three different plot lines here? Or like, like what, what's really uh, tying it all together? Uh, but yeah, kind of, mi- kind of missed note to introduce Chibi storm and not have her around, but I think she's going to be uh, more prominent, uh, prevalent on the, the next issue. Cause she's on the cover. And, um, yeah, no, it was. Uh, I, I did like that part where it's like, uh, Spider Man being hit on by like the fucking awesome warrior, and then yeah. that orc crickle, <laughs> that baby yeah. orc crickle, it was just like the creepiest fucking thing ever. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's great. It's like, um, like sword and sorcery, Conan shit. Yeah, like, that's some shit using from Conan. Yeah. And I like how, like, when, when Cap was giving a speech and it's like, even, like, Uncle Ben and Peter Parker is like, oh, really? he's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's, he's going to unite them all. And it's like, nope, not this time. He tried. He, he did try. <laughs> yeah, pretty great. All right. Next up, let's talk about Thor 17. Ooh, okay. 
Uh, written by Donnie Cates, drawn by Michelle Bandini, colored by Matt Wilson, lettered by Joe Sabino. This is the finale to the Revelations storyline, where Thor is brought together with his dad, his mother, and his sister. <laughs> the only person missing is Loki, and I guess Balder, but Balder's not acknowledged a ton in the comic. <laughs> no. I mean, in the 80s he was. He was one of the most important characters. Oh, yeah, okay. Into that. Yeah. Um, but that was when the book was entirely placed in Asgard, and all the gods mattered, and it was great. Anyways... Um, first thing I want to say is I love Angela so much more in Marvel than I ever did in Image. Oh, I know. <laughs> she is incredible. Um, they have an awesome fight scene. And I, first of all, Frigga's new look. Yeah. Love it. And I love the, we wait for the God of the hunt, the who, the God of the hunt. Mm-hmm. This fucking reveal <sighs> is fucking bananas. And I love it. It looks so much better. Even through a screen as a double page spread, it looks so much better because it did not do it justice here on the phone. <laughs> Yeah, so it's just her on a giant cat with two machine guns. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just insanity. And they just tear all the bad guys up. And then they they basically have a family meeting <laughs> where they're basically like Thor and or I mean, Odin and Frigga kind of have their conversation about our relationship changed. And he's like, why are you the god of the hunt? She's like, well, I used to be the goddess of marriage. It's like, oh, shit. And fertility. <laughs> and it's like, bro, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> um. And then basically it comes down, Angela summoned Thor because she's like, you're fucking up as a, as a king. Do better, basically. <laughs> and yeah, uh, they're, they're sitting there talking it out and everything. And in the end, Thor gets a call from Captain America on a cell phone. <laughs> and he's like, oh, this is a cell phone. And she's like, I understand the concept. Like, <laughs> so he answers it and Th- Captain America is like, it's gone. Bjolnir, it's been stolen. Or it's been called. Or it's been called. Um, <laughs> and then I'm very excited because down at the bottom it says next to find Mjolnir, Thor turns to his new master of spies. Our boy Throg is coming yes. back. Ah, <laughs> oh, so good. The Frog of Thunder is returning. Love it. It's just the dumbest thing Marvel's ever done, and it's the best thing they've ever done. Yeah, it could be in every issue. I'll be fine with that. So. <laughs> No. Uh, but pretty good um, yeah it's interesting to see that you know I want to know where this is going is it going to be a new Thor is it going to be a bad guy stole it you know yeah. like, I, I think I'm leaning more towards a new person with the, with the mallet mm-hmm. um, I think it's curious in the group of X-Men the the baby star brand's not present so if baby star brand has the <laughs> Thor, Thor's hammer I'll love that that'd be hilarious that'd be amazing it has the fucking star brand and that, like, oh my god, <laughs> like the most powerful toddler ever. <laughs> like, it'd be great. So. But yeah, no, um, I, I, I fucking love this issue. Um, I, it's like the whole like family dynamic aspect of it, where it's like you, mm-hmm. you, you always get very little dumbass vague shit from Odin. So it's like to put it to have him to have him be like like that cliche dad is like, oh, you're none of this. I'm the man of the house. Blah blah blah. And you're like, no, motherfucker, you're gonna sit down. You're gonna listen. And then he does, and you actually get a back and forth yeah. with him. Fucking loved Angela. You're talking about like like she's better off here than she was at, at Image. Yeah, her call out is like do better, or the actual first heir to the throne yeah. will take it. And I'm not fucking around with you, dude. I love dude. Like just setting the <laughs> setting the guy straight was just so good. Because again, like it's Thor, it's Odin, like the manliest of men of the gods. And it's like to just have him put be like kind of stooped down to be humbled like this. Mm, fuck yeah, loved it. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty great. I really enjoyed it. And like part of me was like, oh, I wish Loki was there. But then part of me was like, oh, he changed that dyna- dynamic so much. Yeah. I don't want him on the edge talking shit. Yeah. That story, you know, and so th- I thought that was a really good choice not to have him there. Okay. Next up, the Marvels. Five. Uh, written by Kurt Busiek. Drawn by Yildre Sinar, colored by Richard Asanoff, and lettered by Simon Bolin. Uh, so, yeah, this is that massive crossover one that we got. Um, and again, it, there's so many characters that when we get we get issues of this, it doesn't progress too much storyline-wise. Because we have to check in with so many people. But it does seem like we are getting to the point where we're actually going to make, you know, make an effort. They're going to go on the attack. Um, Arrow joins with her injured arm and uh, we actually get officially introduced to Warbird. Yeah. 
which is cool. She's a new character that they created for this book series. Mm. So um, I'm curious to see where she's going. She's very mysterious about her past. And she I doesn't know, tell anybody. Anything. But as a war bird, she also does have like those Shi'ar feathers on her head. So it's very curious. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. I was like, that's an interesting code name to choose. Mm-hmm. Um, but Doctor Strange is like, yo, I need a bounce. And then he, we get pretty decent replacement in storm <laughs> yeah storm shows up is like i'll handle this and then i like the bit where like i think it was tony was like oh are you here as a mutant or blah, blah. <laughs> and then and then steve is like shut the fuck up <laughs> he basically is like we're glad to have you storm and like just like tony stop being a little bitch basically um we get one page of namor yes. and it was amazing because it's namor <laughs> so i wish he was on this mission right <laughs> And then we get a shot of the original Vision, which is kind of cool. That's like an old school. Arcus. Yeah, that's like way back in the day, so, yeah. which is cool because it is dealing with these original books, mm-hmm. like Lady Lotus and stuff. Like, so it's definitely a hell of a callback. It, it is. Very, I did like the, like this issue was just like, this issue where we're just like, well, the plot demands it, so this is happening. Literally, almost for no other reason than like because of that character who wants it to happen. Yeah. Move on because the plot demands it. This is happening. It's like. Okay, that's one way to tell a story. (laughs) Just deal with it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, there's so many moving parts. Oh, yeah, totally. Sometimes you just have to be like, yeah, they showed up. Don't worry about (laughs) it. I just like that Warbird had like a little mini freak out. It's like possibly even days up there. (laughs) Just (laughs) waiting for the ship to just pass by. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So let's move on. Let's talk about a finale. Ooh. One more finale for the week. Non-stop Spider-Man number five. Ooh, I was wondering when we were going to get around to this one. Yeah, I wanted to save it kind of the end. It was a shared one, so yeah. I, well, I thought about putting it with the other Spideys, but yeah. Uh, written by Joe Kelly. Art by Chris Bacalo, Corey Smith, and Gerardo Sandoval. With, oh boy, Tim Townsend, Wayne Foucher, Corey Smith, Victor Nava, Victor Alazaba, and Gerardo Sandoval in inking. Uh, colors by Jim... Charlampanis and Chris Sotomayor and letter by Travis Lanham. This is the end of nonstop Spider-Man. It was a five issue run. Damn. <clears throat> yeah. And it's interesting because it's the secret life of savages part two. Yeah. So yeah, but basically the entire issue is Spider-Man being poisoned, falling out of, a, of an airplane, <laughs> which is great. Um, While his psyche is literally deteriorating. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's also a great moment where the one person that Zemo feels he can count on is revealed to be a black man. <laughs> and Zemo's like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> like, so so they're falling out. He basically throws Zemo out of the ship, the airship. Spider-Man's going after him. Spider-Man takes the sword. And the entire time he's like, why do I have a sword? Because his brain is melting. He's trying to figure it out. Um, he's falling. He keeps saying, but like, why do I have the sword? Why do I have the sword? And he's just like, Oh, also, I'm very tempted, sorely tempted to name this episode Karen Emo. <laughs> it's so good. I know. I was like, oh, it's so good. He's like, wait, do I have a, why do I have a sword? And then he remembers fluid gymnastics, break surface tension. Terrible idea. So he makes sure the sword breaks the water first, mm-hmm. which basically makes them not explode into pieces when they hit the water. Yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> he saves Zemo's life, and Zemo's like, wow, you saved me. And he starts fucking stabbing him. <laughs> like, it's brutal. And it looks like he kills him. Like, it's just filthy die. And then Spider-Man transforms. Yeah. Into not not exactly Demo Goblin. I mean, Demo uh, was Doppelganger. Right. But but it looks a lot like it. Like, there's more more Spidey looking, though. It was, it's more because he didn't grow, like, the, the extra arms like a spider. It's more like of a centaur spider. He grew, like, the body of a spider. Yeah. But he also grew the face. And the face of one. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of being more humanoid, it's definitely more spider-ish. We're left on a cliffhanger. And luckily, we find out, if we turn the page, that we are actually going to be getting another book that takes off directly off this called Savage. It just says Savage. I've been told it's going to be Savage Spider-Man, but we'll see. There's there's been a Savage Spider-Man book before, so so it should be that. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm very curious to see where this is going to go. And if it's going to come directly out of this, is he going to be that crazy spider person for a while? Right. Like, like I get that it got canceled, I guess, but or if it did end here, but it's just like it cannot. It cannot. You cannot just like cliffhanger this part like this. There doesn't be more. 
Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, it was a good run. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed nonstop. It was fun. yeah, me too. So that takes us to our X books. We're gonna start with Wolverine Hoo-hoo. number sixteen, Miles Morales cover. <laughs> oh wow, that looks really cool. Yeah, it's Tony S. Daniel. I mean, name. but it's like the color scheme difference. It's just like it's so fucking cool. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, I loved this issue. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> my favorite issue of Wolverine so far. It was good. Um, written by Benjamin Percy, drawn by Adam Kubert, colored by Espen Gruntetern and with Frank Martin, and letter by Corey Petit. So as we know, Wolverine's basically looking for Solemn. And he finds him. And Solemn's like, let's have dinner. <laughs> like, basically, let's have some wine. And he's like, no, that evil pirate dude, he lied to you. He's the one that stole it, or he's the one that broke into the ship. And killed Christian Frost. He's like, "Guess I stole the diamonds, but I stole them from him because he had already stolen them. That's not, not wrong, right?" <laughs> and Wolverine's like, "This doesn't sound right. This sounds like a lie." And so they go and confront the pirate dude, and then basically he finds out the Psalms line. <laughs> like he just <laughs> wants to get rid of the pirate dude, and they have a big fight, a big Wolverine fight. I love this shot of him pulling up the anchor with a little mermaid oh, on it. Fuck like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. <clears throat> But they have a really cool fight, and he uh, throws the anchor around the dude and tosses him overboard. <laughs> so he sinks, which is great. We go to Emma, and I love the the whole Emma Wolverine dynamic I always have, mm-hmm. where they respect each other but don't necessarily like each other. Yeah. And he, I love that Wolverine basically is like, hey, some things aren't my job. Some things need to be done by other people, which is really cool because Wolverine never really does that, so... <clears throat> um, he basically finds where Solemn is. Solemn has a little piece of Erico that's still attached to Krakoa, and it's basically just an orgy. Um, yeah, it's like, uh, and he's he's even fucking the island, and it's like, oh, okay. And Solemn's like, hey, you, you, you know, let's have fun, narcotic pleasures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he's just like, you know. And then Emma shows up, and Emma's, Emma's like, I'll handle this. And so basically, yeah, Emma handles it and Wolverine doesn't have to. And I really like that because, again, Wolverine, not every problem can be solved by stabbing. So. Especially when you can't really hit into an adamantium skin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, but it was really cool. And then we got a tease of, you know, the hand's new hell bride whose husband I killed at the altar. Hell hath no fury. So when he died, when he was in hell and he had the new Miramasa blade mm-hmm. made, he had to do that. So. That was a cool tease, and that like I think we're going to get more Wolverine versus Ninjas, which is always great. Yeah. So yeah, good good stuff. Uh, next, we're going to talk about Sword, Ooh. number eight. Um, written by Al Ewing, drawn by oh god no, I don't Kukuya Villanova. There we go. Colored by Fernando Cifuentes and lettered by Ariana Mayer. Um, this issue is it's a filler episode i would say yeah because i don't think it does anything long term it might set something up but it does a really good job of establishing storm's role on erico like on on the planet you know as the regent yeah yeah so first we start off with this just absolutely beautiful shot oh i know i love that page just right off the bat we have just this beautiful shot uh i have to say I absolutely love so much the art in this book, specifically the way that Storm is drawn Mm -hmm. to be definitively black. Yeah. Sometimes people draw a white person's face and color it in when they make, you know, a person of color. But she she very much looks like, you know, many, you know, African American celebrities I can think of. You know, she has a look of a lot of them in some of these shots. And I absolutely love that because it makes her, it just makes her look more unique and more real and awesome, you know? And then uh, this fucking shot, by the way. Oh, I know. Like, just this book is full of just I want that really episode. Cool, cool shots. So, in the end, uh, Tarn, who we know from uh, Hellions. Hellions. He wants to challenge Storm for the um, the Regency, and they have basically they have their own version of the Crucible where they can fight for the Regency. Yeah, and I think the cool thing is that he um, we always refer to him as the other Sinister, you know, the Sinister of the <laughs> other world. Yeah, 
And you know, Sinister is like, wait, you can just manipulate genetics at will? <laughs> like, you know, Sinister is like, fuck you. That's too easy. <laughs> like, like, so I really dig that. But basically, yeah, he completely warps her body, takes away her powers, warps her into this unrecognizable creature, basically. Mm-hmm. Powerless. And so, yeah, no powers. And it's like, how could she possibly win this? Well, because she's Aurora Monroe. And she basically takes a knife and jabs it in him and is like, yeah, you could kill me, but I'm going to kill you first, basically. Like, so the she- precision, like she she doesn't, she stabs his chest, but just to where on the cusp of where like the blade is, is about to pierce his heart to where now it's, it's like, yeah, I just wounded you, but now it's on you. What is your next step? Do you think you're quicker than me before I fucking kill you, dude? Despite what yeah. you ju- how you just deformed me. That is awesome, Aurora. <laughs> yeah, it's so cool. <clears throat> but yeah, I just it's it was just a really cool again, it felt like a filler issue, felt like a development kind of thing, but it was a really good one. I think the only thing that was like the the part that wasn't necessarily like the filler part was uh, the actually the mix of kind of more funnier was uh, the info page. Because we've only been alluded to that uh, like the Araku had like their own uh, quiet council, like their own like season uh uh chairs. And we finally got everybody's like role on this one, except for of, of course like the elusive like there might be another set, but of course, like we have right. dawn, day, dusk. It should be night, of course. Uh, but it's very elusive on who had who those three could be. And then uh, I guess like also my little highlight of the book too was uh, frenzy and uh, Cora just like going back and forth uh, talking about Aurora. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, one thing I dug is the last shot where she sees <laughs> that's her with the mohawk, right? Yes, the mohawk oh, totally. <clears throat> she lost her powers when she was Mohawk Storm. Oh, that makes so much sense. Yes. And she was still the leader of the X-Men at that time. She still led the X-Men with no power. And now she's here. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So it's also the time, I think that's the time when she fought Kalisto for the leadership of the Morlocks. Okay. So, which is, which was a knife fight basically. So, <laughs> yeah. So references abound. All right. That takes us to our last issue. Oof. <laughs> <We're here. laughs> um, so we're going to talk about Inferno number one. Um, we'll do the creative team. So <clears throat> kicking off his last glorious run with the X-Men for now, hopefully uh-huh. uh, written by Jonathan Hickman. Where, where is the? It's a little ways. It like... There it is. It's after like the whole, like them trying to take over Orcus. Okay. It's really deep. There it is. Okay. <clears throat> Written by Jonathan Eggman. Drawn by Valerio Shiti. Colored by David Curiel. Letter by Joe Sabino. <clears throat> this is Inferno number one. Also, what cover did you get? Um, I will be getting cover A. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, okay. Are you ready to see how what a madman I am? Oh, God, let me see. Cover A. Uh-huh. Cover B. Oh, that is such a good one. Yeah, I did see that one. I was so tempted. Just like swap it out. Cover C. Oh no, that's the best one. Yes, I need to look out for that one. I I, I do have the cover D. <laughs> Ooh, nice. I do have a. Uh, uh, I, I am gonna get the variant for a sword that has like all the different storms like throughout throughout the times. They've been doing it for like a few other mm-hmm. a few other heroes. Um, that that yeah. one's waiting for me. Nice. So. We built up a lot to Inferno. Yeah. A lot has happened. And it all centers around two things. <laughs> Myst- Mystique and Destiny. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side, Orcus. Yes. As soon as I open this book, the first info page mm-hmm. is Omega Sentinel talking. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, we're going back to Orcus, aren't we? <laughs> like, they are scare the shit out of me. <clears throat> and we see... Charles being resurrected by Emma. And we're like, cool, that happened. And I'm like, that's curious because we never find out what happened there. Yeah. But we find out later in the info pages that the X-Men have made several assaults on Orcus. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Did he die on one of those assaults? You think he actually finally went on one? Maybe. There's one that's redacted. Uh, That's like the only one that doesn't mention. Yeah, exactly. So it's curious. But basically, yeah, we find out that X-Force continuously keeps attacking Orcus and keeps just getting wasted immediately. 
which actually is not the smartest thing because now Nimrod's learning how to kill Wolverine very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not the best. Um, but yeah, we, we see it happen and um, we find out there's more than one Nimrod. Uh, obviously, they're being mass produced. That's the whole point of it. <clears throat> and we see all these Wolverine skeletons they've saved from killing him over and over. <laughs> that's a scary sight. <laughs> And they're starting to put this together, like these have to be clones or copies or something like mm-hmm. that. So they're starting to put together, hey, they can resurrect themselves. The fact that that is starting to get built from multiple angles, I think that's going to be a big moment in X-Men books when the world finds out. Yeah. <clears throat> and then we also check in with Moira, who we haven't seen much. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> and we find out, understandably her issue with destiny um, or one of them at least where in one of her worlds or one of her lives, she cures mutant mutantism. So, cause she wants to die. She wants to be able to die mm-hmm. and mystique and destiny show up, blow up, kill everybody. She knows. And destiny tells her, you're not going to do this. You're going to be one of us. You're, you know, you're going to assist us. You're going to be a good mutant basically. <clears throat> and, Basically, she tells her, I've seen your future. You're not immortal. You'll li- live 10 lives, 11 if you make the right choice. And we kind of knew that. Yeah. So we're like, okay. And then to teach her a lesson, Destiny has Pyro burn her alive. Slowly. But slowly, so she doesn't forget what fa- a failing to change feels like. <laughs> oh, God. That's fucked up. So bad. I totally thought Moira was going to be straight up a villain. Mm-hmm. Now I'm kind of like, shit, I'd be mad too. <laughs> like, that's fucked up. I, I, I wouldn't want her around either. <laughs> Just no, I'm like, fuck this bitch. She's crazy. <laughs> like, and we find out she's not actually against precogs. She's against destiny. Yeah. That's the specific thing. So, And we, we have seen her flipping through Destiny's diaries as well. So that's part of it. We get a quick appearance from Horticulture, which is always fun. They're the worst. <laughs> in a good way um and then moira and charles and magneto meet and they're basically like trying to talk to her about it and they, she finds out they've been tracking her movements basically which is very interesting mm-hmm. and they're just basically they're like what are we going to do, do about nimrod that's the whole point point. and they're also like we need to get rid of mystique because of the whole destiny thing and she's in the the, the quiet council quiet council and they're like, well, there there are two seats open. Why don't we just, you know, make it all a big change? There's a big change coming. They can't kick her off, but they can suggest she leave, you know? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so Moira's like, we'll collect all of the DNA that we have of Destiny and destroy it. Destroy every bit of it. And it's like, okay, we're going to call this meeting. Call this meeting. Oh, also we get a great scene with Cypher. Where it was oh. clear he just got the shit fucked out of him by his hot water. <laughs> it's like, I saw somebody put like this, the smile when he's drinking the coffee. And it's like when you spent the night getting pegged by your giant. <laughs> I was like, yes. Like, I was like, I was like, excellent. <clears throat> and yep, they're just like talking and everything. Everything's going on. This shot was fucking amazing. Oh, yeah. Of the quiet council with the storm in the front. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so basically they're like, you find out that Cyclops is stepping down as the commander. He's still going to be a captain. Yeah. He's just going to step down as commander, and Bishop is stepping up. I think that's a good choice. Yeah. I know you have your Bishop issues, <laughs> but I think he's a good choice. Um, and we found out that Psylocke, Quanin Psylocke, is stepping up into the, the spot for Gorgon. Yes, I fucking love that. Yeah, that's a good choice. So, And that's all like fun, and it's like, oh, cool, big changes, great. And then the Quiet Council is like, all right, well, you know, let's meet. And they're talking and stuff. And I like that Charles is trying to be sly about it. Mm-hmm. He's just like, we shouldn't be afraid of what lies before us. Some of you should not fear embracing a little happiness. Basically, like, some of you probably don't need to be on the council. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so obvious. And so they're like, okay. And they're like, well, you know, we can we can nominate anybody we want to join the council. And... um Mystique is like, change is a good idea. She's like, I know a mute we should consider for the council. And he goes, what? She goes, every time we're like, no, the time is now. Mm-hmm. I offer a candidate to the council. I'm going to read this whole fucking thing because I don't care. <laughs> I offer a candidate for the council who sits in the dominion of the mountain, a mutant island of Krakoa. Come forth, mutant. 
and someone comes, and then we hear Destiny's uh, prophecy. There will be an island. Not the first, but the last. This place will seem to be hope for our kind. When those days come, remember these words. Bring me back. And if you cannot, if they will not, then burn that place to the ground. And then we see it's Destiny. (laughs) Or at least somebody dressed exactly like Destiny, because Destiny wears a mask. Yeah. So... And then Mystique says, shall we vote? And then we cut. <laughs> I'm so excited. So fucking excited. I love I love Sinister's face. The, just like him just cracking up. Like the- <laughs> Yeah, he loves it. He thinks it's hilarious. <laughs> no, it's all, but yeah. it's all come down to this. And I'm, I'm so fucking excited. <laughs> Moira, Moira's not going to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> After the- I want to know how they, how they brought her back. <laughs> like, did they trick the five? Like, oh, I mean, there was another variant where it's like a mystique, and one of her arms is just like it, it basically looks like she's like turning into beast. And I was like, "Fuck, have I been too harsh on beast?" And like, she's been kind of like plotting a, a point that way. Uh, but yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt if mystique would just like almost force them in a different way. They would need a, a psychic to put Destiny's mind back. That's true. So to me. The only ones that power for are Jean, Emma, Xavier. I don't think Quentin has the self control for that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. He's more raw power. Yeah. You know? Maybe Hope if she's around another one. I don't know. Yeah, it's true, probably. So someone's involved. Someone. My money is on Emma. Because oh, Emma resurrected Xavier at the beginning. That's true, yeah. They made a point of showing us she can do she's it. She's power. She's just powerful. Cool for that. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. But oh, I love it. I can't wait to see where this goes. Having this going on at the same time as the trial of Magneto, and we just got the onslaught of relations. Just so much good X Men shit going on right now. It's like so like, much is at stake right now. <laughs> yeah. So. All right, guys. That's all the books that we have this week. Hostway, anything else you want to bring up before we go? Ooh, uh, no, no. I'm, I think I'm good. <laughs> So I got my hard copy of Allison Ledland number five. Very happy I finally got that. As you guys know, we bought it digitally because we couldn't find it. Uh, but I'm very happy I have a complete collection now and I get it signed. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I also picked up the new D&D book and it's fucking amazing. I cannot wait to play this. It's the entire thing can be ran in a pacifism run. You don't have to at any point kill anything. That's really cool. Every single encounter can be handled pacifism. Nicely. And it's very much like there's a lot of homage to Wizard of Oz and Labyrinth and stuff like that because it's all about the Feywild. You're trapped in the Fey world. Right. And <clears throat> so maybe somebody wants you to dance. So you have to make a perform check to dance with them. <laughs> and if you do well, this happens. And there's a lot of like, you know, the, the video game cliche so and so will remember that. Oh, yeah. Like there's bits at the very beginning, you're at a carnival. And there's lots of little things you can do. And each little thing you have has an impact later on. So, like, you might, uh, if you help this mermaid who can sing, uh, she'll give you a singing lesson. She'll teach you how to sing a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's cool. That's a fun little character thing. Cool. Well, later, when you're trapped in fairy, you have to sing a song for an important plot point. Uh And if you you helped her and she gave you the lesson, you have advantage on the check. Oh, okay. That's cool. (laughs) Like, there's a bunch of these little things that come into play. Mm-hmm. And the best thing is when you uh, basically one of the hooks and the hook I'm going to use when I run it is everybody in the party when they were a child snuck into the carnival mm-hmm. uh, when it was here. And it's like a, it's a fairy carnival. So it's like, you know, it's magical and shit. And um, when you when you sneak in without a ticket, they take something from you. You, you have this vague memory of losing something. Uh-huh. And the examples they gave were the ability to keep secrets, the ability to smile, oh. the artistic creativity, uh, a cherished doll or stuffed animal. Uh, you lost your handwriting. No one can understand your handwriting. Uh, sense of direction, sense of fashion, or three inches of height. What? <laughs> so... You remember when you went to the carnival, you lost those things. Well, this enables you to get it back if you get to that point. Ooh. So it's, it's like a unique hook. You know, usually it's like 
so and so is terrorizing the neighborhood. Go take him down. Like that's usually the hook. This is more. It's just so much fun. Yeah, like, I'm excited. Like it just. I've already read through one of the. It's very. If I had to compare it to one thing, it would be Oz. Okay. Like it, it very much has like because the fairy world is separated into three countries and they all have their unique feel and spoiler alert, there's kind of evil witches, you know, like it's just, it's just fun and I cannot wait to run it. And there's, uh, they added a <clears throat> humanoid rabbit race to the game that you can play and they look like this. Oh, they're so cute. I know. Right. And then they added fairies too. So you can play a fairy. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I love it. It's great. I'm just pouring over it. It was hard for me to put down, put it down to read my comics this week, as well. I'll say so. Um, other than that, I promise I'll start Sandman Volume Two sometime. <laughs> so that's everything I needed to go over right now, guys. Thank you so much for joining us on We Have Issues. As always, you can check us out at the following locations. First of all, you can always check us out on Geek Elite Media. So at Geek Elite Media on Twitter, as well as GeekEliteMedia.com. You can also uh, check me out at WHI Podcast Keith on Twitter. Our producer Liz at WHI Podcast Liz on Twitter. Hostway at Hostway Reads Hostway on Twitter. You can also check out our other show, Jukebox Vertigo, where we build a playlist of music every other week with our friends and special guests. And uh, you can find that at Jukebox Vertigo. Our next episode that's going to be coming out is featuring the pre-mentioned producer Liz. Yes. And it's amazing and a train wreck and I love it. <laughs> I cannot wait. That episode's so much fun. If you want to hear the true disappointment in Hostway's voice, listen to that episode. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, you can check that out at Jukebox Vertigo. You can also check Hostway out on uh, Twitch. Yes. He is playing, and his name is Hostway Plays Hostway. Currently playing through God of War. Finished. Uh, yes. through, for, what, are you done? Like are, I thought there was more after the ones you were on. Oh, no, no, I, I finally platinumed. I, just like the Greek era, I finished. Like I, I will come back to oh. Norse. Oh, I thought there was more after three. Sorry. Uh, no, there was a uh, Ascension did come out, but that was actually like a prequel to the prequel. So we and you already did. Oh, yeah, that we, one, we right? played that one first. Oh, what are you going to be playing then? Uh, next up is since uh, it's October. Oh, we talked yeah, about it's this. officially October first, so I will be having the long Halloween, the longer Halloween, and the longest Halloween. I'll be playing all of the Arkham uh, the Arkham trilogy games <laughs> throughout October. Nice. Yeah, I think you'll. Uh, how, how many have you played? I've only ever played Asylum. The first one. Asylum, I, in my opinion, I still think Asylum is the It was best. very fun. Um, it got very complicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, city, I loved, but it was just a little too big for me. Okay. Because um, it, it's a city. Yeah. Know, so, um, And then also, you kind of get repetitive villains. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you're like, oh, you're back? <laughs> like, okay, I just beat you up. Like, so. But no, I think you'll really enjoy that. Nice. Oh, you should do the Telltale games, the Batman Telltale game. Oh, oh okay. Nice. I, I... That's very Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> so. But anyways, thank you guys so much for joining us. As always, we appreciate you joining us on We Have Issues and on all of our shows at Geek Elite Media. So as we wrap up, thank you so much for every time you guys listen. And don't forget to always geek out. This concludes our broadcast.